um, taking part in the um, taking part in the EGU's um, Committee of Education gift workshop. As I say, it's day four. We're focusing on environmental history today. And it's a morning session. Um, you'll have gathered, we've tried to vary the session starting times um, to allow for different people's time zones. Um, for me, this is quite early in the morning, if I'm truly honest, um, particularly with the Easter holiday just around the corner, um, getting online for eight o'clock in the morning um, was something of a challenge. Um, but no doubt many of you are, uh, are well ahead of that. Um, particularly if you're on Central European time. Um, so it's nine o'clock onwards. So I'm Dr. Phil Smith. I'm a member of the Committee of Education. I have been for a number of years. I'm also its chair, um, its secretary. Um, so responsible for keeping notes and things like that of our, our meetings through the year, which help us um, plan um, a program that we hope is really engaging for you. And um, in terms of engagement, I think our, our opening speaker today is a nice example of that. Um, we were just um, in our preamble, just chatting away and all remembering a book entitled um, Island on Fire, which was actually um, the product of um, the EGU funding Alexander Witsey um, as a, um, a journalistic fellow um, to cover um, a particular geoscience event. And what she did with her partner, Jeff Kinipe, was um, write about something called the extraordinary story of Lackey, the volcano that turned 18th century Europe dark. Um, and hearing about it through attending EGU, um, I went away, and even though I'm not a geoscientist, strangely, um, I went away and got a copy of this, and Alexander came to Norfolk, and I heard a present on it. Um, I'm based over in, in the east of England, in Norfolk, and it was a fascinating story. And when Costas proposed the title for this year's um, gift workshop, um, the influence of earth processes on civilization um, and society. I thought, how perfect, we've got to have a story on Lackey, remembering um, what I'd read in Island of Fire. And we know already that um, our first and second speaker this morning both have copies of the same book. Um, so I'm going to kick off by welcoming um, and introducing to you Dr. Catherine Kleeman. Um, hopefully you're already seeing her first slide on the screen, um, a scene um, that's familiar to anyone who's visited Iceland, I imagine. Um, Katrine is from the Leibniz Institute for Maritime History in Bremerhaven over in Germany. And uh, she's going to give our first talk this morning, which is entitled The Physical and Societal Impacts of Volcanic Eruptions, the case of the 1783 Lackey eruption, a story I'm very much looking forward to hearing about. Katrine, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. And um, yeah, good morning to everybody. Thank you for having me and thank you for organizing such a wonderful event. I very much enjoyed all the talks um, I zoomed in for so far. And yeah, I hope you'll also enjoy my talk and that you can learn something that helps you with your classes. Um, as Phil already said, today I'll be talking about the 1783-84 Lackey eruption and its physical and societal impacts. But before I start with that, I want to give you a little bit of information on my background and approach. Well, my talk and my upcoming book, which is the publication of my doctoral thesis, are based on a volcanic eruption and geology more generally, I'm coming at this topic from the perspective of environmental history. So I'm a historian by training and during my doctoral studies, I've also taken courses in geology. And um, just quickly coming back to this book that was already mentioned, luckily this came out in 2014 while I was writing my master's thesis also on Lackey and a couple of years ago in um, at a volcano conference in Arizona, I had the pleasure of actually meeting the author of meeting Alex. So that was very exciting. <laughs> 
Um, yes. So, um, yeah. So my work on the history of the lack eruption is a contribution to the growing field of environmental history. And you might ask now, what is environmental history? And in the broadest sense, according to a definition by uh, John McNeil, environmental historians write history as of nature existed. And they recognize that the natural world is not merely the backdrop to human events, but evolves in its own right. And I've often been asked why a volcanic eruption is environmental history. I argue that volcanic eruptions are ideal subjects of environmental history, as depending on their explosivity, lava and gas production, they can have direct and indirect impacts on areas in their immediate vicinity and on regions far away um, or even the entire planet. And lava can impact the landscape near the volcano and have adverse effects on the health of people, animals and vegetation near and far. This is a satellite image um, from the Eya Fjatja Jökult eruption in 2010, which gives an idea of what it might have looked like in 1783. Far reaching, but often indirect and therefore seemingly invisible connections between different weather phenomena are described as teleconnections by meteorologists. This concept has recently been adopted by historians and is perfectly suited for my work as the connections between the actual eruption and its hemisphere consequences remained hidden for a very long time. Volcanic eruptions um, can have an impact on the environment and society and are therefore a topic of environmental history. Another characteristic of environmental history is its interdisciplinarity. An interdisciplinary approach is a combination of two or more disciplines, which allows, in this case, a historical topic to be studied from a different perspective. In my dissertation, I combine my historical approach with environmental history, climate history, historical disaster research, the history of science, and geology. And just a quick note on climate history. Climate historians mainly work with the so-called archives of society, which are historical records that include logbooks, chronicles, weather diaries, letters, and so on, um, which have information on harvests, floods, or snowfall, for example. And natural scientists work with the archives of nature, which provide proxy data to reconstruct past climates. These can be um, tree rings, ice cores, lake sediments, stalagmites, and so on. All of these proxies have different sets of advantages and disadvantages and can provide different resolutions, which means they reveal decadal, annual, or even seasonal information. And in the last two decades, interdisciplinary collaborations between the natural sciences and history have become more common, although they're not without their problems, such as communication or terminology, for example. And combining the archives of society and nature is um, advantageous as one can cross check the, the re reliability of the sources. And now coming to historians and geologists who actually have a lot in common. For both, it's impossible to make direct observations of events that took place in the past. Both use hermeneutical processes, historians use written, uh, written sources, and um, geologists, as you know, use outcrops. A text needs interpretation, as does the outcrop. And due to the time that has passed since the outcrop um, was formed or the source was written, some information might have been lost or eroded away. And we need to fill the gaps with knowledge and reasonable assumptions to interpret them. What historians assume that people in the past thought, felt, and acted like we do today, geologists assume that the geological processes of the past are comparable to those that we can observe in the present. Okay, now I'm moving on um, to the Lackey eruption. And the Lackey eruption was a flood lava event that took place between the 8th of June, 1783 and the 7th of um, February 1784 in Iceland, which you can see here um, to see where it's located. 
Over the course of its eight months long eruption, the fissure reached a length of 27 kilometers, out of which it released 14.7 cubic kilometers of lava. Because this figure is really hard to wrap your head around, this equates to roughly 5.8 million Olympic sized swimming pools. This might give you a better sense um, of this volume. And it covered an area of about 600 square kilometers, which is roughly twice the size of Munich. And you can see this volume on the map um, at the top. It's a dark gray color here. And this was the largest volume of lava released by any eruption on planet Earth in the last millennium. And on the bottom, you see a picture of another uh, 2011, or 2000, yeah, 2014 eruption, I think, of Badabunga, um, which is what it might have looked like in 1783. And yeah, here you can see what the Laki fissure looks like today. You've seen this image um, on my first slide before. Um, this volcanic eruption has many names. In Iceland, the fissure itself is known as Laka Giga, which means the craters of Laki. Laki is the mountain I'm standing on in this bottom picture, taking the picture of the southwestern fissure. Um, however, um, in Iceland, the event is are primarily remembered for its consequences, either as Skafta Elda, which means the Skafta fires, in reference to a river in the area that was um, evaporated during the eruption and flowed instead with lava, which overran meadows, fields, churches, and farms in the southeast of Iceland. It's also referred to um, as Moduhadendin, which means famine of the mist. In Iceland, the volcanic ejector poisoned the fields and therefore the animals feeding off them. Many animals perished, causing malnutrition, famine, and diseases in the human population, which led to the deaths of about 10,000 Icelanders, which was a fifth of the population at the time. Internationally, however, this eruption is mainly known as the Laki eruption. What is unique? about Iceland's geology is the interaction between the Iceland mantle plume and the mid-Atlantic ridge that formed Iceland. Iceland first appeared 24 million years ago, from which point onward it continued to grow. Iceland has 30 volcanic systems, which you can see here on the left, and they produce about uh, 20 to 30 volcanic eruptions per century, one every three to five years. And the circle that you can see here um, shows the approximate location of the mantle plume today. And to put it in a different perspective, um, the Icelandic volcanoes have produced roughly 2,400 volcanic eruptions since the end of the last ice age. Scientists established this from tephra layers in Iceland and ice core records in Greenland, where many Icelandic um, eruptions deposit tephra. For the last 1,150 years or so, we also have some historical records, the more, the closer you come to the present. And Iceland was first settled in um, 871 AD. Since then, Icelanders have collectively gained much experience with many different types of volcanic eruptions, but only a handful of flood lava events, such as the Laki eruption. Let's look at Kirkjubaja Klaustur um, in Iceland. This is a, a village really um, in southeastern Iceland. On this picture, you can see what it looks like today. And in 1783, this uh, was a very small settlement in, yeah, in the same place. <laughs> um, here you can see it again on the map. Um, on the 8th of June, with Sunday, uh, that was a day with clear blue skies and calm weather, and the locals in Klaus Tour likely were on their way to church. Then around um, 9 a.m., something unusual caught the parishioners' eyes. Dark clouds appeared behind the mountains, steadily filling the sky. A faint sun was now menacing red behind thick clouds of ash, tephra, and gas from an atmospheric eruption plume that reached as high as 15 kilometers. 
the tephra fallout resulted in complete darkness up to 100 kilometers from the volcano. If you disregard the palm trees in this image, this is what it might have looked like. Um, not only in, in, is culture in a region that was most affected by the volcanic eruption, but it's also the region where some of the eyewitnesses uh, lived that wrote accounts of events um, that are yeah, about the lack eruption. And my main source here is for the time um, of the eruption, it's an autobiography of a local reverend by the name of John Steingrumson. From John's writing, we know that the residents of Karlsruhe and the surrounding area were affected by the lava and also that they could see the fire fountains behind the mountains and that they heard bizarre and terrifying noises. However, it did not stop with just terrifying noises because Karlsruhe is um, supplied by two large glacier rivers, one of which you already briefly heard before, the Skafta, which you can see here, um, and after which the eruption is named in Icelandic. And the other one is the Kvefisfjord, um, which you can see here. And yeah, yeah, they're both mighty glacier rivers, and they actually dried up in 1783, and in their stead, lava started flowing soon after. Naturally, this terrified the residents. The lava destroyed farms and churches as it scorched the land on its path down from the highlands. But surprisingly, no human lives were lost to it. John Steingumson's church and Klaus tour remained unharmed. On the 20th of July, it was a Sunday, mass was held at the church. And the lava was still moving and threatening the village and even the church. However, when mass ended, the lava stood in the same place as it had been before. So the fire sermon had stopped the lava flow, or so they chose to believe. Um, in this process, John earned himself the title of fire priest, for which he is still known today. And yeah, even today, you can see a lot of the Laki lava field, fields still in the area, and they look a little bit like this. And... The Lack eruption had 10 eruptive episodes. The first six weeks, uh, the first six weeks saw the most vigorous phase of the eruption. So by late July, um, around 60% of the magma had been erupted. And by October, it was around 93%. So these um, eruption capacities illustrate where the impacts on Iceland and beyond was the most intense during the summer of 1783 rather than later. However, lava was only one product um, of this eruption. The other one, more deadly, um, were volcanic ashes. And ash is a common hazard in Iceland. I'm sure you remember in 2010, the Eyjafjallajökull eruption. Um, however, in the case of Laki, <clears throat> Um, the eruption seems to have produced exceptionally large amounts of fluorine, which is a highly toxic halogen. And in, yeah, in the case of Laki, the pastures and fields were contaminated. The animals would continue to feed of these fields for lack of other food, and most of them would fall ill and subsequently perish. In small doses, fluorine is beneficial to human health, it's um, contained in a few special toothpastes, for example, but in large quantities, it can cause dental or skeletal fluorosis, which results in bone fractures and deformations. And the same is true for livestock. Only few things grow in Iceland due to the brevity of the seasons and the extreme weather. The diet of most Icelanders was meat-based at the time, and it was catastrophic for Iceland's um, subsistence farmers to lose most of the livestock. Between 1783 and 85, about 76% of Iceland's horses, 79% of the sheep, and half of the cattle per perished. Iceland at the time was a Danish dependency and help from Denmark was only slow to arrive. As you can see here, Copenhagen is located approximately 2,000 kilometers away from Iceland. 
um, Iceland was also subject to Danish monopoly trade, which meant that only certain Danish merchants were allowed to trade with Iceland during this time. And many foodstuffs um, were exported in late summer of 1783, early autumn, um, which was yeah, on the eve of the worst famine in Icelandic history. When news of the eruption arrived in Copenhagen, it was already early September 1783, and although a ship was prepared to head to Iceland, it was already too late in the season and the weather had turned bad and the ship then had to spend the winter in Norway before it could reach Iceland in the spring of 1784. In the summer of 1785, around um, 10,000 people died of diseases um, such as fluorosis and dysentery, of hunger, or they simply froze to death in the subsequent cold winter. Um, yes, as you might have guessed by now, um, the eruption's consequences did not um, end on Iceland's coastline, um, but they also reached beyond. In addition to large volumes of lava, the Laki eruption also produced large volumes of volcanic gases, particularly sulfur dioxide, that were transported beyond Iceland by the jet stream. Within a few days, these gases reached continental Europe, where they would be visible as a dry fog, a haze, or a mist that was witnessed from June to August 1783 in varying intensities. The fog was special because it was dry and not wet, unlike most fogs. The barometer did not indicate any change, as it would if this was a sign of approaching bad weather. It was not dispersed by rain or wind, no matter what direction they came from. And the fog was fairly dense and also reduced visibility, which had an optical result. The sunrises and sunsets appeared reddish or blood red. Perhaps it looked a little bit like this. This is a picture that was taken um, during the, the wildfires in, in Canada. Um, another characteristic of the dry fog was its sulfuric smell, which was noticed by some of the contemporaries. This means that the fog caused a poor air quality and the fog wasn't merely a meteorological phenomenon as it also caused health problems, such as sore eyes, headaches, or breathing difficulties, particularly for people who were already suffering from cardiopulmonary diseases, such as asthma, for example. And the dry fog also caused damage to the vegetation in some areas. It, for example, scorched plants and grass. Studies by John Grattan and Anja Schmidt have shown that the dry fog likely um, produced excess mortality in, in France and England in the months following the eruption, most likely from cardiopulmonary related diseases. The, La, um, the Lackey haze covered large parts of the Northern Hemisphere, which you can see here. I indicated a few locations um, and when the first mention um, of the fog was made. As you can see, the fog also reached beyond Europe. It reached North Africa and even the Altai Mountains on the border to China in early July. In July and August of 1783, Constantine Francois Volny, a French philosopher, traveled through Egypt and Syria and kept a tra travel diary. And he outlined how he often experienced fogs um, during sunrise that vanished later in the day. He also noticed that the sky was often overcast um, and the sun was often invisible the whole afternoon. He wrote, I was frequently so enveloped in a white, humid, warm and opaque mist um, as not to be able to see four paces before me. The foggy appearance of the atmosphere seemed to be so familiar to him that he rather noticed its absence than its presence. So he wrote, on my return from Suez between the 24th and 26th of July, we had no fog during the two nights we passed in the desert. It's well established that distant volcanic eruptions can have an impact on Nile floods and the weather in Egypt. 
Usually the Indian Ocean monsoons bring rain to the Ethiopian highlands in early summer, and the rain then feeds the Nile. In July, the Nile floods reach Cairo, where the peak of the floods usually takes place in August or September. Brian Zambri um, and others um, have argued that the asymmetric cooling in the Northern Hemisphere after the Lark eruption shifted the intertropical convergence zone southward, which led to a low flow in the Nile and drought and famine conditions in Egypt. In North America, the dry fog was also visible in Labrador in what is today uh, Canada. Weather journals from three different coastal uh, settlements contained strong evidence for the dry fog. These settlements were founded by the Moravian Church with the purpose of ministering to the migratory Inuit tribes there. The weather observer in Ukak, uh, which you can see on the map here, noted on the 20th of June, hazy and sunshine. On the 3rd of July, he remarked, hazy and sunshine and rain. For several days, thick smoke fog through the air as from a great fire. So we pulled the ikas, let some great woods on fire. They do so sometimes. So he explained this weather was the forest burning behavior of the local Inuit tribes. Um, on the 29th of July, he wrote, it was cloudy and there was sunshine. The air was full of smoke for the five weeks past. And while it's of course possible that this was um, forest fires, the timing fits perfectly with the lack eruption. So we can assume that the dry fog was also visible here. Now let's return to Europe, which has been the main focus of my work. And um, yeah, here in this map, you can see the first mentions that I found um, of the dry fog in, in several European cities. And the fog was one phenomenon in the summer of 1783. However, the summer in Europe played host to several other unusual phenomena as well. Um, one was the blood red sun that I already mentioned. There also were numerous and severe sandstorms. There was a great heat in Western and Central Europe seemingly more earthquakes than usual, and reports of several volcanic eruptions in Germany, a newly emerging island off the coast of Iceland, and a long-lasting meteor over Western Europe. We will now talk about some of these phenomena um, in a moment. And today we know that not all of these phenomena were related to the Laki eruption, but the contemporaries um, seemingly believed they were all linked to one another. And what makes this eruption so interesting is that those outside of Iceland were oblivious to the fact that an Icelandic volcanic eruption was taking place. Naturalists and amateur weather observers were left alone to speculate about the origin of the dry fog and undoubtedly inspired by the enlightenment developed many different theories, some of which I will present to you today. Um, just a quick word on my sources. I um, worked a lot with newspapers from different parts of Germany, which appear uh, several times per week. Um, I also worked with scientific publications, monographs, and scientific articles within journals. Of great importance are the ephemerides of the Societas Metrologica Palatina, which is the Metrological Society of the Palatine. Um, which was operating about 30 weather stations across Europe that utilized standardized instruments and made observations at three set times per day. And they published their results in Latin. Um, I also worked with some uh, weather diaries and annotated almanacs um, from the UK and also from the United States. Um, yeah. The ideas on what could have caused the strange weather varied drastically. The smoky haze was initially believed to be caused by a peat fire in northern Germany, or maybe a forest fire um, yeah, in, in northern Germany or the Netherlands. It only became, um, here's a picture of a forest fire today. Um, 
and the, these fogs only became unusual once news started to pour in that this phenomenon was observable in several parts of Europe, so it was not a local phenomenon. Um, and by far, the most popular theory, um, at least in the German territories, that emerged was that strong earthquakes in Calabria and southern Italy caused these smelly fogs. Um, a crack in the earth caused by the earthquakes was believed to have emitted sulfuric gases from the inside of the earth, and the winds um, carried them around Europe. That was the idea. In February and March 1783, an unusual series of five strong earthquakes occurred in Calabria, um, which you can see here with the dates. And yeah, some of these earthquakes uh, reached a magnitude of up to 7.0, which caused widespread destruction, several tsunamis, and loss of life. Um, numbers vary drastically, but possibly 30 to 50,000 people lost their lives during these earthquakes. Um, multiple aftershocks occurred as well um, throughout the rest of the year, and they were very present in the newspapers during the summer. Italy wasn't very far in the mind of Germans at the time. It was a place um, many newspaper readers were familiar with from travelogues, as it was a popular uh, destination for a grand tour that wealthy young men would do, such as Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who went to Italy from 1786 to 1788. Um, in 1783, earthquakes were represented in the media a lot. Um, here's a map of all the mentions of earthquakes that I found um, in this year. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there were also earthquakes in Eastern France and Switzerland on the 6th of July. Um, th this was not as severe as the Calabrian earthquakes. Descriptions tell us that some chimneys fell down and it probably reached a six um, on the Mercalli scale. A newspaper article from a few weeks later um, sums it up as letters from Portugal reports that several areas of this kingdom experienced strong earthquakes on July the 6th. The same is being reported from England and Iceland. The whole of Europe seems to, be, seems to have been plagued by this horror. So this shows us a sort of um, pan-European awareness of these earthquakes. There also was news about a newly emerging island, um, a burning island off the coast of Iceland. This island was of volcanic origin too, and it was called Nie, which means New Island. Um, Danish fishermen had found it in March um, of 1783, around 50 kilometers southwest of the Reykjanes Peninsula, which you can see here in this image. And when the fishermen found it, the island was still covered in fire and smoke at the time. The story of this new island received a lot of media attention during the summer, um, much more than lucky, as this eruption was still unknown. Um, the news um, of Laki only reached Europe in September, and the news of this new island reached um, Europe in, in June. Um, so at the time, the fog was visible. On the 28th of June, the new island was discussed in the um, Hamburg Correspondent, a newspaper, which cited a message from Copenhagen from the 24th of June, and the report concluded, it is very odd that this natural event occurred at the same time when Messina and Calabria have been devastated by the most terrible earthquakes. Um, when a ship came in 1784 to claim Nye for the Danish king, it had already vanished again, and today it's um, a submarine crater. If you have ever read a text about Lackey, you've probably read about how Benjamin Franklin supposedly made the connection between the eruption um, and the fog. I argue that he didn't. Um, other scholars uttered the idea that Icelandic volcanoes were responsible for the weather phenomena. Um, the first one to make the connection was a Swiss meteorologist by the name of um, Johann Rudolf Salis Maschins, um, a German physics professor at the University of Copenhagen, Christian Gottlieb Kratzenstein, 
also connected um, the Icelandic volcanism in, in the shape of Nye with the haze as early as the summer of 1783. Um, there's also a French naturalist by the name of um, Jacques Antoine Morc de Montredon, if, um, yeah, who presented his ideas about the sulfuric fog and its volcanic origin in the shape of Nye in August um, of 1783 and published this in 1784. Benjamin Franklin, who at the time was the um, ambassador to the United States in France, um, suspected a connection with Nye or Hekla. Hekla is a um, yeah, well-known Icelandic volcano that's been known since medieval times as the Gate of Hell, for instance. Um, and you can see a picture of Hekla here on the left. Um, and yeah, he presented Franklin um, presented his ideas in a letter to the Manchester Literary and Philosoph Philosophical Society in 1785. But what is often forgotten is that in the very same paragraph, Benjamin Franklin speculated that the haze might also have been caused by the tale of the great burning balls that flew over Scotland, England, and France on the 18th of August in 1783. So he's just speculating whether volcanoes are to blame or whether it is this fireball. Um, at the same time, there also um, were stories about um, volcanic eruptions in Germany that never actually took place. And um, these yeah, volcanic eruptions or these stories about volcanic eruptions were retracted a few weeks later. Um, the mountain that you can see in this picture is the Gleichberg, um, which is actually of volcanic origin, um, which was known at the time, but it hadn't seen an eruption for 15 million years or so. And on the um, 22nd of July, the royally privileged newspaper from Berlin printed a report from the 24th of June that um, stated the Gleichberg, which is located um, two hours away from here, produced um, vapor, which increased daily until the whole area um, was covered in per permanent thick fog. The forests in this area are all white rather than green. The fog is true natural sulfur, which spoils everything it touches. The sun and moon rise and set in blood red color. For eight days now, inside the mountain, there was horrendous and frightening bashing as if cannons were fired. Then the whole mountain opened up under plumes of thick sulfuric smoke. And in the whole area, you can hear a constant terrible roaring and rushing from the opening. There are praying services held in all churches. The people in the surrounding villages have fled as they are afraid the whole mountain may collapse. Um, yeah, I was very intrigued when I first um, started finding these reports. Um, and yeah, I even found more. There's um, at least four more of similar stories. Another one is the Kotterberg, which is located near Dresden today. Um, another one is the Rossberg near Tübingen, which um, also produced a subsurface war. Um, there's another source about strange um, noises and shaking felt in the Gottesberg in Silesia. And then there's um, a burning mountain. Um, in, in near Saarbrücken, which actually is a um, yeah, subterraneous fire that um, yeah, started um, in the, I think in the 17th century, probably from a mining accident. And um, yeah, it's actually still, still a burning mountain today. So that one is, um, is real. However, the other ones did not have volcanic eruptions in, um, in 1783. And here you can see a few more pictures of what these mountains um, look like today. And this definitely seems to be an interesting trend. And yeah, eventually after a few weeks, the stories about these volcanic eruptions were retracted again. People traveled to these places and realized that there were no volcanic eruptions. And I have an article uh, forthcoming in the journal Global Environment about this. And I'm very curious if it might trigger any searches or finds of similar you know, fake eruptions in historical sources from elsewhere in Germany or in Europe. 
Um, there were many more fascinating theories that contemporaries developed at the time, but unfortunately I'm running out of time, so I can't quite cover them. Just um, a few brief words on the aftermath of the eruption. The winters following the Laki eruption were exceptionally cold. In Central and Western Europe, these winters saw ice drifts and flooding in several river regions, and sometimes the flooding events are still single in the history. That means the flood marks um, this high have only very rarely occurred again since 1783. The winters from 1783 to 86 were not only severe in Europe, they were also severe in um, the eastern United States. Um, and it's important to note that the lack eruption took place during the so-called Little Ice Age, which is a versatile period that saw um, glacial advances and overall cooler than average temperatures. It lasted from um, around 1250 to 1850 and was coined in 1939 by the geologist um, Francois Mattes, who coined the term Little Ice Age for these glacial, glacial surges that occurred um, in the late Holocene. And he called them little compared to the large um, ice ages prior to the Holocene. This term is slightly misleading as it suggests a world of ice and snow, but scientists and historians alike use it. Um, and yeah, several crime historians have carried out work on the Little Ice Age. Um, yeah, and it was overall um, a cold climatic regime, but saw extremes in both directions. And the weather did um, improve again after 1786. And um, I'd like to point this out here, um, because this comes up quite a lot in Q&As that I've done in the past, the Lac eruption did not cause the French Revolution. Um, this line of argument has been disproven by the scientific community. French climate historian um, Emmanuel Le Leroy Ladurie argues that the, ar that the harvest in France have been good up until 1787 inclusive, then they were mediocre in 1788, and um, yeah, th that was followed by subsistence uh, riots and social unrest from the summer of 1788 to 1789. And um, yeah, David McCallum um, calls this, um, yeah, this legend an overly simplistic historical assumption. The Lackey eruption impacted various regions differently, and some were badly affected by the pollution, others by the cold, and a few by the confusion um, caused by these phenomena. However, these regions did not exist in a vacuum. The Lackey eruption only stirred up pre-existing conditions and sentiments. Um, it would take almost 100 years until the Laki fissure was established as the cause of the strange weather in the summer of 1783. And all the news about an Icelandic eruption reached Europe in September of 1783, the theory of an Icelandic volcanic eruption causing the strange weather remained only one among many. So when was the volcanic eruption in Iceland connected with the unusual weather in Europe? The connection was actually only established in the 1880s, so 100 years later, when Amund Helland and Thorvaldur Thorvaldsson, a Norwegian and an Icelandic geologist, became interested in the eruption. In an archive in Copenhagen, Helland had come across the work of an Icelandic naturalist by the name of Sven Paulsson, who um, you can see here on the left. And he had discovered the Laki fissure in 1794 and um, drew a map of the lava flows that clearly shows um, a fissure as a source, not a cone-shaped volcano, as you might expect. Um, but his findings were not published um, as his funding body had run out of money. And yeah, so it took until the 1880s to be discovered and it was only fully published in um, 1945. And in 1883, something else happened that I'm sure many of you know about, the Krakatau eruption in um, today's Indonesia, which highlighted that volcanic eruptions can indeed have far-reaching effects around the globe, and this renewed an interest in the Lac eruption. And yeah, as I have 
um, have hoped um, to show you is that the lack eruption and its physical and societal impacts are a fascinating and a multifaceted research subject. There's many different aspects to look at and yeah, it was even a sort of detective story trying to figure out um, when the dots between the dry fog and the actual eruption were connected. And if you would like to learn more about the lack eruption in my research, you can read my book, which will come out later this year in uh, the Greuters Historical Catastrophe Studies series. And my book is titled Missed Connection, an Environmental History of the Lack Eruption of 1783 and its Legacy. And the book will appear open access so you can read it free of charge. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Lovely. Thank you, Katrine. If we went all virtual and everybody had their mics muted, you would be getting a round of applause, <laughs> um, as is traditional. Um, I, that's the one thing I really miss, I think, about these um, online gatherings that we can't quite hear um, the rounds of applause that people get. Um, thank you for that. I posted um, something in the chat to try and encourage people um, to pose their questions there. Um, but if they um, want to raise a virtual hand, hopefully we will spot that as well and uh, enable them to ask their question verbally. But I'll, I'll kick us off with one. Um, you spoke about a fifth of the population, I think it was, being killed, mm -hmm. the Icelandic population being killed. Have their numbers recovered to sort of um, how long did it take for number, population numbers to recover to pre lackey levels? And do we know what the biggest cause of death was? You mentioned a great number during your talk, but what was the most significant one of those? Yeah, um, let me start with the, the last question. Um, I think it was hunger, like it, they, most people really died from the famine. There are some studies that try to um, figure out um, in terms of skeletal remains, whether people actually died from um, fluorosis, like whether there were deformations in the, in the skeletal remains, but they have not um, been so successful in finding those. So it was mostly um, yeah, famine and, and um, diseases related to malnutrition that, that caused these deaths. And um, it, overall, I think it took two to three decades for the numbers to recover. But in the worst affected areas in, um, in yeah, southern Iceland, where, where Cluster is located, for example, it took, I think, until the 1830s for the population to recover, not only because um, many people died here, but also many people moved away um, to other regions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just scrolling back through the chat. Um, lots of complimentary comments, people appreciating your interdisciplinary approach, which I think will be new for some people. And uh, it even made me think, actually, my daughter's quite interested in science, but she's also interested in history. So, yeah. you know, maybe there is actually a job out there for her at the end of the day. Yeah, oh, it's we're not going. mutually exclusive to like both. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Um, Question here from Costas: Are there any modeling results um, regarding ashfall and smoke over Europe? Yeah, good question. Um, there's uh, quite a few studies that, that look um, similar to the one I've shown you, where um, it's a blank map of Europe and you can see um, these numbers um, for the date in June when the the fog first appeared. And there's there's some modeling on. Um, on when the fog went where, um, which is not all that logical sometimes because it seems to have a, a appeared in Central Europe first. Well, there's parts of Scotland that were affected and then Central Europe and then Western parts later. So um, there's there's some, um, some studies on that. And there's also some ash fall um, in Scotland um that has been found i think maybe maybe norway um yeah okay and miriam is asking i have a question about the stories about volcanic eruptions in germany there were written testimonies but actually no eruption there is that 
that what you were saying? She just wanted clarification. Yes. So there's um, these stories could be found in the newspapers. So we um, see these reports um, from towns near these alleged um, volcanoes. And they are then printed in, in different newspapers um, all over Germany. And um, they're all anonymous. But that is normal because all the reports are anonymous. And um, so we never really know who wrote these reports. But um, some, for example, the Gleichbeck story is very, very detailed. And it seems very convincing. Whereas the other stories about these other um, volcanoes are, are much shorter. and may suggest that somebody's just you know jumping on the bandwagon and trying to use fear that people might have although it's not really clear what the intention is because this city is really far away who um for all they know at that point might have great weather and might not at all be affected by this fog so it's it's a bit of a mystery um why these stories came up during the time and i personally would be really curious to see if this is just a case in germany or whether it also happens elsewhere so uh, quite clearly this idea of fake news is not a modern phenomena no no <laughs> <laughs> okay and um i think just a final one are there any accounts of people dying in numbers over europe after the eruption yeah, um, there's um, a few studies um, by uh, John Grattan, for example, um, who is from Aber Istwith in Wales. And he has done studies on Britain and also on France. And there's, there's peaks in mortality in the summer, which is in general unusual because you usually have peak mortality in the winter. Um, but it's not quite clear whether this is related to the pollution whether the pollution is um, only a contributing factor, maybe um, because the, the timing is a little bit off. If you would expect um, severe pollution and asthmatic attacks, you would assume the dying to happen right away, but it happens a little bit later um, in, in, like in the late, late summer months when the peak pollution has already passed. Um, so there definitely needs to be more research in this field as well, maybe on a European scale. Excellent. Thank you, Katrine. We're going to draw it to a close there. Um, and thank you again um, for a fascinating introduction to our morning on environmental history. And we will move on. Um, we'll move to Francis Ludlow um, over in Dublin. He's based at Trinity College. And Francis is going to talk to us today um, about a number of different um, interrelated ideas, um, earth system processes in ancient papyri and medieval chronicles, and human history in tree rings and ice cores. Francis, if you can share your first slide with us. Yep, I'll just set that up now. And we'll know if the technology is saying yes. This is right, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's just see share screen there. So hopefully, you're, yeah, you hopefully can see that. The title slide. It's coming. Yep, there we go. Okay, that's yeah. perfect. Um, welcome to um, Virtual Gift 2022, and thank you for your contribution in anticipation. Oh, yeah, it was great to get an invitation and um, I really appreciate that and the opportunity to, to hopefully engage with um, a sort of wider audience like this. Um, also, a hard act to follow there after Catherine's uh, talk, but um, she also did a great job in introducing some of the, the sort of principles behind volcanic impacts on society and, and climate. So that, that's, that's very helpful for me. Um, so let's let's get into it then. Uh, so my work falls within the remit of climate history, um, which is sort of a, a, a weird combination of history and climatology, and it's um, within I suppose it situates itself within the broader discipline of environmental history, and it aims pretty much to uh, use historical sources to reconstruct past climate conditions and to examine interactions between climate and society, including 
social vulnerability and responses to extreme weather or other natural hazards. And from my perspective, I think it works best when we combine written archives, which are the normal domain of, of historians, with natural archives. These are things like tree rings and ice cores, otherwise often known as paleoclimatic proxies, um, which we'll look at um, this morning. So um, I'm going to try and look at or, or structure the, the lecture in, 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 a lot, in two main parts. Um, the first will focus on an example of how historians, through the sort of sources that we uh, uh, ex, uh, have expertise in and our methods of assessing them might inform some questions in climate science. And the second will then look at how climate scientists and its data and its sources can help inform us as, as historians of uh, human history, in particular, obviously, the influence of climate on, on human history. So to begin, and especially after Catherine's talk, few people will now need me to, to, um, to stress just how impactful volcanic eruptions can be on society, both directly um, in the region that experiences the eruption, but also more uh, widely thanks to the, the climatic uh, and atmospheric impacts of these of these eruptions. Um, but I usually start off with this uh, lithograph, um, which is one of my favorite historical images, and it depicts St. Genarius in the top left, if you can see him, coming in to intercede to stop the great 1631 eruption of Vesuvius. Um, and I suppose given the, the widespread destruction that's been wrought by the lava flows in, in uh, the surrounding uh, plains below among the various settlements, it's fair to say maybe he came a little bit late, but as we see from Ketchum's talk, these eruptions can also have effects that are much further afield through their influence on, on climate, particularly, which is what I'll look at now. And so how does this work? Um, well, the basics are pretty well known. Here we see, this is a famous image, you'll often see this in, in volcanological uh, conferences, it's um, on the left the 1991 eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines. Um, and that was one of the biggest eruptions of the 20th century. And it injected large volumes of sulfur dioxide gas into the stratosphere in this eruption column, where it oxidized to form an aerosol haze, sort of a haze of little aerosol, sulfate aerosol particles. Now it turns out that these sulfate aerosols are actually very good at reflecting incoming solar uh, radiation or sunlight back to space before it ever gets to reach the Earth's surface or the troposphere where all the weather happens. So you get this cooling effect um, on, the, on um, the, the Earth's surface for generally up to three years after a very big eruption like this, because it basically of these aerosols refle reflecting the sunlight back to space. Now we can actually see several distinct aerosol layers in this image of the stratosphere on the bottom right. Um, and this image was taken from the space shuttle in the months immediately after the Pinatubo eruption. And you can compare that to um, an image in the top right here, uh, taken in 1984, uh, when there has been no eruption immediately preceding it. And you can see the stratosphere is clear or absent of these aerosols um, by contrast. So that's the basic mechanism in any case by which eruptions impact climate or the start of the chain of events by which they impact climate. But, and that's well known, and it's fairly easy to grasp, but the impacts as we study more uh, into this of apparently similar eruptions, say occurring in, in the similar latitudes with similar apparent magnitudes, actually turn out to be quite different in terms of their impact on climate once we study this. Now, so that gives us lots of work to do and try and understand why that might be. And uh, I've tried lots of ways of trying to quickly covering all of the uncertainties that are being examined or that we think are important, um, or the known uncertainties, I should say, in our understanding. Um, and that would think, you know, um, include things like the specific latitude of an eruption, the season of an eruption, um, how much water is injected into the atmosphere along with all the sulfate, lots and lots of variables. But ultimately, I decided uh, in the time available, that there's really too many to effectively do that list here. So instead, I decide just to flash this scary looking graph um, that shows just some of the climatic and atmospheric processes that occur after uh, a major 
um, volcanic eruption. So I should also add that our knowledge of the impact of big volcanic eruptions on climate and atmospheric processes comes mostly from the small number that have occurred in the modern period, um, for which we have satellite and instrumental weather records available. And most of these eruptions haven't actually been particularly large in a longer term context. So our knowledge is, is based on quite uh, a small sample of the, uh, the possible range and sizes of, of uh, major explosive eruptions that can and have occurred historically, and which makes uh, studies like Catron's all the more important, in fact. Now, I think it's fair to say, and I won't go too far down this, this uh, rabbit hole, but it's, a, it's pretty important that we actively improve our understanding of the social, climatic, and atmospheric impacts of past big eruptions now, especially since there's a growing number of scientists and politicians who are considering and uh, actively studying um, artificially mimicking the effects of volcanic eruptions by uh, spraying or otherwise um, putting large volumes of sulfate particles uh, artificially in the stratosphere to try and counteract global warming. And it's a very active um, area of research now with, with scores of, of new papers each year, um, either trying to model the effects of what would happen if there was a, a, a sulfate uh, aerosols injected in certain regions of the stratosphere in certain periods and certain um, uh, quantities. And also more recently, a lot of papers looking at the sort of ethical, moral and governmental issues or challenges that that sort of practice might actually um, give rise to. But one thing we can certainly contribute as historians is to look at and continue to look at the, the impacts of past volcanic eruptions. So we can start to learn more about that by drawing on natural archives to reconstruct a history of major eruptions that extends beyond the modern era for which we also have the best sort of written and scientific observational uh, records of big volcanic eruptions. And once we start getting beyond the, the last two centuries or so, there are many big eruptions that are very poorly documented uh, and, or not documented at all. But geologically, when you when they're discovered, can be shown to have been massive events. Um, and they start, we start seeing those even in the early 1800s, where there's particularly there's an 1809 eruption, which is known as the unknown eruption, but seems to be quite big, maybe somewhere in the tropics, um, and probably had an impact on climate or, or helped compound the impact perhaps of the Tambora eruption in 1815. We don't know where it is, or where it was located. Um, so we need other ways to extend our history of, of past uh, explosive volcanism. And undoubtedly, ice cores are the best current natural archive uh, to use for this purpose. Uh, so these are created in basic terms by drilling deep um, into the great ice sheets in places such as Greenland or Antarctica, where you can go down several miles uh, into the ice and retrieving those cores um, very carefully and eventually getting them back to a lab and melting them or samples of them and measuring effectively the sulfate that is present in each sample of ice. And that's gotten there mainly uh, through fallout uh, under the, the influence of gravity. Um, once the sulfate is up in the, in the atmosphere and it's circulating around and it gets to the poles, eventually it will fall out. Um, just purely on the influence of gravity, even though they're very tiny particles, um, known as that's known as dry uh, deposition, and you can also have uh, sulfur being captured in snowfall um, and uh, falling out in directly in the snow as well. And so over time, you're getting uh, the annual snowfall that's falling in places like Greenland and Antarctica. Um, capturing a sample of how much sulfate was in the atmosphere at any given time. And as each year's new snowfall accumulates, what's below it gets compressed into these uh, individual layers of ice, which are often very visible and can be quite thick and um, are often nicely annually banded. So importantly, then you can count these layers back from the top of your ice core and in that way, assign a year to each layer in a very similar manner, in fact, to uh, tree ring counting. Um, so this allows for a very precise date. So you can put a precise date onto your sulfate value uh, for each year. So once we melt and measure the sulfate 
in each uh, annual layer of ice, uh, we get something that looks like this graph on the top here. And this graph basically shows the annual sulfate values measured from the GISP2 Greenland ice core for the last 2000 years. Um, and when a big eruption occurs, you can pretty unambiguously identify it through these large sudden sulfate spikes in the ice. Now these levels are usually very clearly higher than the background level. There's always some sulfate being deposited in the ice. Um, but you can see here these sudden spikes, uh, which is not um, part of the normal background deposition each year. So these are the telltale signs or the fingerprints of each uh, of a volcanic eruption occurring at this time. And because we're actually directly measuring the sulfate here, effectively, you're, the size of the, mag uh, of the spike gives you some information um, on how climatically effective, that would be the fancy term, this eruption is likely to have been because that uh, the impact on climate of the eruptions is generally mainly linked to how much sulfate it was able to put into the atmosphere. Other things like the amount of ash that is eject injected into the atmosphere are also important, but the, that tends to, the ash tends to settle out a little bit quicker, so it doesn't have um, as long-term an effect as the sulfate aerosols do. So we're actually measuring the, the, the material here that is directly affecting the climate, so that's sort of a nice direct link. And when you stare at these sort of graphs uh, long enough and, and you can get paid to do this, which is great. Um, if you want to go into this sort of career and do this sort of research, you can start to note uh, pretty quickly that volcanic eruptions again in various periods before the modern era have occurred at much greater magnitude and frequency. Um, so in the 20th century and 21st century, we have been in what's known as a volcanically quiescent period. Um, but if you look at the graph, which, which covers the last 2,000 years, you can see on the far right-hand side that there is um, a, a departure from the, the sort of the long-term trend, and you get this, this, this average in, increase in the average background. You can see the graph sort of rising up there to the right-hand side, and that's obviously humans um, putting uh, aerosols um, into the the atmosphere artificially through combustion engines and, and industry effectively. So how do we examine the, the impact of these eruptions on climate, first of all? Well, sources like tree rings, which we're going to come back to later in the second part of the lecture, can tell us a lot about their impacts for the spring and the summer season, for example, when the trees are actually growing in the growing season. But they don't usually tell us about volcanic impacts in other seasons. Um, in the winter, for example, where the trees generally don't care um, about climate conditions or what the weather is like um, because they've gone dormant. So we need other types of sources of information to tell us, to complement what we might get, for, say, from tree rings um, and round out our understanding of the impacts of uh, these big volcanic eruptions and climate in the other seasons, for which, through which humans, of course, have to live as we don't go to hibernate, hibernate in autumn and winter. Um, as much as we might like to. So let's look at how we can get, for example, a longer term perspective here, um, taking the case of medieval chronicles, specifically in this example, those that were recorded in, in Ireland and are known sort of in the collective as the Irish Annals. Now, basically, these consist of yearly listings of important events or events that are deemed important according to the scribes which always needs to be remembered. And they were maintained originally in monastic communities across Ireland, such as uh, Clamac Noise Monastery, pictured on the right here, which is situated on the banks of the River Shannon in the Irish Midlands. And they run reliably, it's a bit debated, um, but from around 500 to 1600 AD, let's say. Now they report things like the founding of religious settlements, obituaries of elites, abbots, bishops, and kings, and so on. Um, conflict, all manner of conflict and violence, which we'll come back to again, extreme weather events and major societal stresses, we might describe them as things like famines and plagues and so on. And uh, so generally an uplifting read <laughs> to, to read through these events each year. And today they survive in 22 texts that add up to around 1.1 million words. So it's quite a substantial record that survives though only a fraction of, of uh, what actually existed, um, even what had survived in terms of these sources, even into the early modern period, a lot of them were lost or, or actively destroyed, unfortunately. Um, so definitely a record that is of uh, quite 
considerable interest to a climate historian, we could say. Now, this slide shows the vellum uh, page from the Annals of Ulster, which is one of the more famous surviving manuscripts. And this covers the years 852 um, to 858 uh, AD. The 852, um, the entries for that year end in the top left. And the entries for 858 begin just at the very bottom right of the manuscript. Um, so you can, I've highlighted here just um, some of the uh, key features um, of, of the manuscript that allow you to sort of read it each year. So you've got this enlarged K here, and this stands for the calends of January. So it's basically standing for the 1st of January, and this is the chronological notation that's been used by the scribes to demarcate each new year and its set of, its set of entries. Um, and for the first year, uh, for the first entry of, of this year, we actually have a report of extreme weather of the type that we're quite interested in. And it reads in translation from the, the original Irish. And actually these are a bit, a bit of a mix of Latin and Irish, so very user-friendly to read. Um, but thankfully a lot of them are, most of them are actually translated well now. And it reads much ice and frost so that the principal lakes and rivers of Ireland could be crossed by people on foot and horseback from the 23rd of November, 855 to the 7th of January. Um, 8.56. So because Ireland has such an enormously mild maritime winter climate, um, frequently without any snow uh, at all during uh, the winter, this is actually quite a, a severe weather event. And that's one of the reasons it's been recorded here, of course. Um, and for its spectacular and its anomalous nature, and often in other cases for their uh, material impacts on, on the cattle and on the agriculture as well, which are often quite um, catastrophic and well, in some cases where at least or so the scribes claim. Now, I just uh, put this slide in as I was listening to Catherine's talk. Maybe she could, she could help us in the question time. Maybe she knows whether there is a big volcanic eruption around this time in Iceland. We certainly know that uh, tephra, volcanic ash has been found um, in sediment cores from bogs and lake and lakes um, from Iceland. So we know that that material does get here. And of course she showed that um, a lot of material uh, probably reached Europe from Lackey. And so this is one of the more curious entries actually in the, in the surviving um, uh, body of Irish annals. And this comes from the annals of Connacht. It's on the west of Ireland in 1224. And it reports that there was a heavy and terrible shower in part of Connacht this year, which brought about disease and a very great sickness among the cows and beasts of those regions after they'd eaten the grass and leaves. And when men drank of the milk and of these cattle and ate of their flesh, they suffered internal pains and various diseases. So that's always um, been one that's intrigued Irish historians, but generally has been written off as sort of a fanciful um, or fantastical event to mark the death of, of an important regional king and not actually being taken very serious as an actual physical event that may have occurred. But for me, it's always been just far too specific um, to being totally fabricated. You have this chain of transmission being quite, uh, uh, being charted in quite a lot of detail from, um, from the cattle into humans. And it may, it sounds to me perhaps like fluoride poisoning from a large uh, volcanic eruption that's perhaps probably in Iceland and has dumped a lot of uh, uh, toxic materials on the west coast of Ireland. But it'd be interesting to hear what, what Catherine or anyone else thinks about this uh, later or after the talk. So there's a great diversity of extreme weather events um, as well as reports of major social stressors like famine and disease that are reported in these annals through time. And we could spend obviously several hours looking at each type of these and their distribution to time. Then you'll see that there are interesting patterns in their, in their occurrence and in their non-occurrence and so on. But I just wanted in passing to, to put this graph up to give you a taste of the density of the different types of, of such events that are reported through more or less a 1200 year time period. Um, thanks to these records from the fifth to the 17th century and um, highlight them as uh, a source that is still really underexploited by environmental historians or, or, or natural scientists um, in terms of the record of natural hazards and, and um, uh, extreme weather events that are datable and locatable to quite a small islands. So it's interesting um, as a source, I hope. 
So how can we bring this information to bear in understanding our climate history, and in particular the, the, the role of volcanic eruptions on a, on a more longer term timescale? So this graph now just shows the number of volcanic events in the GISP2 ice core for the same 1200 year period, um, 430 to 1650, that um, are best covered by the surviving analytic text. And I've split um, the graph and the, and the time period covered into two panels here, just so you can see things a little bit clearer. Um, all the background sulfate values have been stripped away statistically. So all you're seeing here with the, these red columns are the dates and the magnitudes of sulfate fallout from uh, major explosive eruptions. You can see there are quite a few, but again, that you know these things don't occur evenly through time. There are volcanically quiescent periods in the past, just like our present period. And there are uh, periods when you would have gotten quite unlucky um, in terms of the frequency and the magnitude of these events. Now, there's all sorts of ways you can go about statistically comparing these events, uh, their dates and so on, to what we find in, in the Irish Annals. Um, and when you do that, you, yeah, you, start, you, you can get some fairly convincing um, figures out but uh, visually it's 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 uh, interesting or simple just to start by eyeballing these dates of big eruptions and going to the dates you know for which there's at least very severe cold being recorded in the annals and just starting to to line them up and when you do that simple exercise you don't need any any fancy statistics to do it you just need the dates of, of the eruptions from the ice cores and the independent dates of these uh, severe cold weather events from the, the Irish Annals, you get no shortage of um, correspondences here. And when you do the statistics, you get to see that this is way more than you would have expected in terms of correspondence and the dating of these, these things, uh, way more than you would expect by chance. Um, so what we're having here effectively is a long-term sort of uh, observational record of the social and climatic impacts of big volcanic eruptions on this region of the, the Northeast Atlantic. So it's almost as if Ireland is acting as sort of a laboratory here or an observational, an observing post through time. Um, and you get to see the sort of uh, persistence of impacts um, on at least a medieval and early modern society uh, and the climate of the region from these events. Um, and that tells us a little bit, I think, about what we might expect after the, the next big volcanic eruption um, or indeed the next phase of, of, uh, of uh, clusters of, of big volcanic eruptions, which might, of course, occur at any time. There could be one happening right now that marks the start of a, of a several decade period of large, of large eruptions. So what to take away from this and um, this first part of the lecture, this first case study, well, that there are many climate historical climate records um, that remain untapped um, and not just from the past few hundred years but much further um, into the past and um, that these shouldn't necessarily be uncritically dismissed um, which they have been unfortunately especially for sources before the 1500s and um, when admittedly they are more fragmentary and they're more alien in their form uh, to, to modern readers they're in harder languages uh, or earlier versions of existing languages, um, the context and the mindset of the authors was quite was much more different to us. Um, so it's it's harder to put your set yourself in in the place of these authors, which is important for assessing their motivations for, of course, recording these events, and yes, determining when sometimes they may might have been motivated to fabricate or exaggerate things. Um, but certainly, I think you could look at this the other way. Um, although you'd want to avoid circularity in your reasoning and say, well, we have this ice core record and people are skeptical of these analytic texts uh, and such as uh, the US National Research Council, which had this important report from 2006 and which did mention uh, these sources, uh, these Irish annals, but uh, avowed that their dating is imprecise and descriptions of weather and climate are often exaggerated. Um, something which the comparison or, or the, the strong link between the ice cores and, and, and these texts actually doesn't bear out, um, including with the dating. It looks like they're quite uh, well dated um, and generally they're not that exaggerated in their descriptions, I, I think. Um, 
So yes, they do require careful assessment and put my point here too, but actually that's what historians are trying to do, um, to put themselves in the place or in the mindset of the authors of these sort of texts as best as possible, to understand the context in which they're recorded and be able to effectively um, identify those descriptions that might be pro trouble troublesome in terms of exaggeration and so on and which are not. And that was a, an exercise I had actually done on this body of text from my thesis. And I think at least uh, my assessment was that at least 90% of these sort of records in, the, in, the, in these Irish annals were, were pretty reliable. Um, now, also to recall that this is just one type of source from just one small region and applied to just one question or problem um, in terms of uh, the operation of the climate system, what drives that. And so, as Catherine has also shown, there are many other types of records from other periods and regions. And so there's really a vast potential for um, working on, on natural history from these written sources or collaborating indeed with natural scientists, uh, collaborations between natural scientists and historians. So part two, we're going to look sort of at the, at the opposite side of the coin and, and um, at how climate science might inform our understanding of, of human history. So we'll take to do this another major natural archive in the form of tree rings. Um, and we'll stay for consistency since it's been introduced um, with the example of medieval Ireland. Um, and so we have here a sample of an ancient Irish oak uh, preserved for around 1500 years in the acidic waters of a bog in Ulster in the north of Ireland. Um, and you can clearly see in this um, image, I hope, the annual uh, growth rings that are coming if you if you work from the bottom of the image up towards this label for the year 532. Um, and you can see that the tree is growing quite well. The, these annual rings are quite wide. Um, but after 532, you start to get into a sequence of much narrower rings. And these reflect unfavorable growing season weather conditions for this tree. Um, now, Things get to progressively worse as we get into the 540s, and actually it becomes quite hard to, to make out each individual ring without a microscope in this case. Uh, interestingly, if we go to the Irish Annals again, even though at this stage they're quite, it's quite early in the record, Christianity hasn't been long established, say, on the island, um, and the tradition of writing these chronicles is only very new, um, you still actually get to see uh, quite a cryptic but interesting reference to a failure of bread in 538 um, AD, uh, which leaves a lot to the imagination, but probably implies some sort of serious harvest failure. And serious because it got, gets mentioned at this early date, um, and not many events are being recorded unless they're deemed of extreme importance, say. And these trees, uh, the oak trees in Ireland now provide a nice environmental back or, or a nice sort of confirmation that there is an environmental context to this report. Um, and of course, actually, as, as we know now, through, through quite a few recent studies, uh, this uh, pattern of reduced tree growth in Ireland turns out to be a representation of what is the, what seems to be an almost global or certain certainly northern hemisphere wide climatic anomaly in the five to late 530s and 540s caused not by just one but three uh, substantial or very large volcanic eruptions in beginning in 536 another big one in 540 and then a, a, a smaller one was uh, coming probably allowing to sustain the impact of these two larger eruptions, earlier larger eruptions in uh, 547. And again, we could certainly have an hour or two of a lecture on, on that uh, sequence of events alone. Now here you can see uh, a map of sites for which we have individual tree ring chronologies as they're known. And these consist of multiple samples from Irish oaks growing over various years uh, for the past 3,500 uh, uh, years. Um, and this is just to show you the density of, of, the avail of the available records we have in terms of this natural archive in Ireland. And in fact, we actually have a record in Ireland that stretches back to about 7,200 years. Um, and elsewhere in Europe from the Oaks, it can be even longer. I think the, the record in Germany is even longer and in England potentially for another millennia beyond this. And th this sort of record to give us information on what the oak trees at least taught about the weather for each growing season 
for precisely dated. So it's an amazing resource for a huge amount of time. So a very attractive, or it should be very attractive as a source for historians. Um, and why do we have such a record in Ireland? At least it's because of all of the, the wetlands, the bogs and, and the lakes we have. And you can see here the, the Belfast dendrochronologists, John Pilcher and, and Mike Bailey, just taking a break from their chronology building efforts through the 80s and 90s uh, when they were driving around Ireland and um, with a chainsaw and sampling uh, these bog oak remains, as they're known, um, that are just often pushed to the side of fields or bogs that have been restored or, or um, uh, transformed into agricultural use. So they're just sitting here and it can be many thousands of years old and um, they survive for so long because these bogs are, are, are acidic. And so rather than the oak, the oaks just basically rotting away when they, when they die and they fall over, they're actually preserved because the acidic water um, suppresses fungal and microbial sort of activity that would otherwise uh, uh, decompose these samples. So Ireland, thanks to all our lakes and bogs, which normally aren't treated as, as, as a good thing, I suppose, by Irish citizens at least, um, contribute to the existence of this record. Um, now, most people here, especially, I suppose, will be very familiar with the process and creation of, of uh, these long tree ring chronologies and how we date each year or each ring to a specific year. But in brief, this, this graph just uh, shows the process uh, in a simple terms. You start by obviously going to a living oak tree or a tree of another species and taking a sample, hopefully not with a chainsaw, um, uh, of that living tree and counting back the rings from the present. And because you know the outermost ring uh, corresponds to the present year, you have a precise calendar date for each of those rings as you go back further in time. But at some stage you run out of living trees um, even in places um, like Arizona, where the trees can stretch for, uh, for millennia, potentially, and certain species. And in Ireland, the oaks last for two, three centuries at most, generally. Um, to continue extending that chronology into the past, you need to get timbers and uh, from oak timbers from other sources. And because oak is such an important structural uh, timber for buildings, you get no shortage of, uh, of oaks being used through time um, in historic buildings and archaeological sites. And you can assign, you can obviously get samples of these and um, you can count the rings and measure their ring widths, but you don't know immediately what date these oak timbers, um, what date each of their rings correspond to. Um, but you can tell that by cross dating them or cross matching them with the, the living oak samples for which you do have dates. And because climate is such a major influence on the growth of the oaks through time in Ireland um, and in Ireland, you know, even though there are variations in climate from the, the north to the south of the island, say it's not enough. Um, such that you will have completely different ring width growth patterns. Um, through time in these different regions. So there's enough similarity in the growth patterns through time so that you can actually match up um, the patterns of growth from your historic timbers with the patterns of growth from your living oaks and then transfer the ages to them so you can continue counting backwards and know each year. Um, so that's sort of a may, maybe a more convoluted description of what is actually a sort of simple process uh, conceptually, hopefully. At least. Now it turns out that these trees in Ireland are most sensitive to uh, spring and summer precipitation levels. Of all elsewhere, trees can be more sensitive to growing season temperatures, for example, in places like Scandinavia, the high latitudes or high altitudes, places like uh, uh, Swiss Alps. And so their temperature variation will be the dominant control or the most or the biggest influence on how big or, or narrow a ring grows each year. But in Ireland, it's precipitation and um, the growing season rainfall. Uh, that's the biggest determiner of whether you'll have a wide ring or a narrow ring. And so knowing that you can start to identify years when the growing season was either abnormally wet, having very large rings, or abnormally uh, dry, having very narrow rings. And this graph shows uh, the average annual growth of multiple oaks from as many site chronologies as we had on that map available for this period. And this period is uh, the 720, 728 AD on the left running to 748 uh, AD on the right. And I've chosen this period of time to show you because it, it, it 
contains one of the more remarkably or profound, you could say, decreases in tree ring growth through the medieval period. And you can see that very clearly here in the green line where the, the, the annual growth rates on average drop off in 737 and especially 738. So the oaks here are telling us something very uh, detrimental to their growth occurs. And um, we can infer that that's probably a drought, a severe drought. Now, because we actually have tens of thousands of oak samples um, from across Europe, spanning the last 2000 years, and even further in certain places, it's possible to directly estimate soil moisture levels um, for this period across, across a, a very large spatial domain for Europe. So we can actually see um, the wider spatial context of this drought that we've seen in, in Ireland with the, uh, the Irish oaks alone. So here we have a map taken from what's known as the Old World Drought Atlas, um, which is a great teaching and research resource, and it's freely available online, these maps. And it just shows the conditions across Europe for 737 and 738. Um, and you can see that drier weather, which is inferred from lesser, smaller growth values in the rings of these trees across this region, um, equates to more severe drought. And you can see basically that Ireland wasn't obviously alone in experiencing this drought, um, but it was very widespread across Northern and Central Europe. Um, in 737, it came a bit more localized in 738, but still persists very severely in Ireland as well, as you can see here. Um, so we now have a, a precisely dated and uh, quite reliable reconstruction of past spring, summer, or just we could say growing season soil moisture uh, extremes. Uh, but why is this of concern, any concern to, to historians or, or history? Well, for, for much of, of the period, for most historians, it hasn't been of any concern. And it's always my argument now that, that it actually is a useful archive for, for students to learn about and for historians to actually use. Um, now, there are many ways we could use it, this sort of information, and bring it to bear to things we see happening throughout time in human history and so on. Um, but we're going to focus on one particular uh, sort of question in medieval Irish history. Um, and this, I guess, arises from the fact that Ireland in medieval period is a pretty grim place. Um, and this uh, 16th century engraving of a cattle raid, as it's known, uh, with uh, the burning of a farmstead on the right hand side is uh, just one example of the type of violence and conflict that's chronicled systematically for more than a millennia in the Irish annals. Um, so we've got a, a very systematic record of violence and conflict occurring every year on the island uh, for more than a millennia. Um, and obviously political historians have spent a long time uh, charting those phases of, of, of warfare and different violence and uh, trying to understand the political and the economic and the cultural reasons or drivers for, for these phases of violence and so on, um, including this um, activity known as cattle raiding, which was almost endemic in medieval Ireland. And it was, it was something of a, and you can see the cattle being driven off here in the top of the, 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 the image. And uh, it's something, it was something almost, it was almost sort of a right of a right, a right of passage for young Irish nobility to prove themselves um, but in, in battle or in conflict and obviously to secure wealth as well um, by just taking it from others. Um, and given in fact that it is about securing resources, it's quite interesting that there has been really no no, no, no attention given to what environmental context this might have occurred in, or what environmental pressures might also have contributed to this sort of behavior. Um, now, this is despite the authors of our sources of the Irish channels, sometimes actually even explicitly telling us that there can be this sort of influence from extreme weather events on levels of violence in, in the society through time. For example, we have from 1465, uh, from the Annals of Connacht again, uh, a report of exceeding great frost and snow and stormy weather, so that no herb grew in the ground and no leaf budded on a tree until the 1st of May, so that's very late um, in the season in Ireland, but a man, if he were the stronger, would forcibly carry away the food from the priest in church, uh, in the church, yeah. So this is, if you're looking at the sort of climate conflict literature, and there's a large literature on that now, very controversial, uh, very heavily contested uh, literature um, on weather, climate, 
and extreme weather can me meaningfully influence levels of violence in the modern period and so on. That would be called a case of um, scarcity induced resource competition if you wanted to know and use the fancy academic terminology. But basically, uh, the concept is quite simple. Um, something comes along, whether it's warfare or, or a natural event, extreme weather, to scarce in resources and food and so on. So to survive, and if you're stronger, you can uh, be motivated, obviously, to seize your neighbor's uh, resources. So let's just return quickly to the drought registered in the Irish Oaks from 737 to 738. Um, it's quite possible to survey these annals for these years and just say count up the number of deaths of, of persons in conflict through these years. So this, if you do that exercise, this is what you, you would find. Um, if you overlay the counts of, of reported deaths, and these are of elite persons, um, kings and, and, and so on uh, through these years. You see a clear spike in any case in violence in, in years, uh, in the year 738 effectively. Um, and that corresponds quite conspicuously um, to the year of the greatest uh, depth of this drought, according to the oak trees, shall we say. Um, so it suggests that there may indeed have been a role for a drought in, in exacerbating tensions, and those tensions may already have been existing. I'm not saying that people are getting along well and they're all great friends and suddenly the weather gets dry and they start killing each other. No, the, comp the situation is much more complex than that. There are lots of rivalries and feuds and existing political tensions um, in medieval Ireland at this time. And so I would see this uh, drought coming along and exacerbating those uh, rather than just causing violence out of thin air. Um, but even if you were to accept that, as being you know a convincing case okay yes there's a particular political context here there are rival uh, family groups and rival kingdoms and so at this particular time a drought could just have acted as the tipping point and um, to cause a, a large increase in violence maybe this is not something that happens uh, you know systematically or very often in irish history and if we were to look at uh, other events, other similar drought events, we wouldn't see this sort of response. And that's a fair that's a fair point. But we can actually answer that now with this combination of natural archives and uh, the chronicles and the annals that we have. How would how would we actually then go about using them to do that? First, we can return obviously to our actual tree ring data, and more specifically, the old world drought atlas reconstruction of spring summer soil moisture that is based on these data. Um, and that's what's shown in these graphs here. The top graph shows the period 650 to 1200. Um, and the bottom graph shows a sort of close up or a zoom in on the period from 900 to 1100. Now, when the green line shows very low values, like those circled in red, we are seeing years in which there was very little spring summer soil moisture according to the trees or inferred from the trees and their growth and um, drought in other words. And we can pick out these sort of years in many different ways statistically in a statistical sense, and we can certainly discuss that later, but for our purposes now it's probably enough to say that I was able to identify 50 such summers, spring summers or growing season periods that were notably dry um, in this period uh, from 650 to uh, 1300, I should have said on the right hand side. So next we could go and see what sort of and how much violence occurred in these years. Uh, but it would obviously be laborious to try and check out violence levels in each year individually. So we need some simple way of seeing how levels of violence may have responded um, on average, say, to all of these droughts uh, combined. Or indeed, you could look at wet weather uh, extremes as well, as I've circled in blue here uh, by looking at the years that are of anomalously large values. So to do that, it's possible to go through these annals and, and attempt to quantify the number of violent events through time. And this graph shows the frequency of violent killings of elites, mass killings, raidings, burnings of, of properties and farmsteads in the annals of Ulster from 650 to 1200. Um, and uh, there's some drawbacks to this approach, of course. Um, you could say that it's reductive. It turns complex descriptions of events in, in these analytic texts into just zeros, ones, and twos, and threes in a spreadsheet. Um, but they, so you do lose some information in this, in this approach. But they, it does, in, in turn, 
uh, give you a bird's eye view of violence reported in the in in these texts through time, and then in numerical format lets us more systematically perhaps compare to other data that's available like the the Irish Oaks and the dry reconstructions. Um, just check my time. Yeah, I'm 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 not far from finishing. But you can see here uh, that there are in this reconstruction of violence reported in in the in the, in the the Irish Channels that there are longer term trends and these are represented in the blue line and where you, there are average increases in violence or increases in the average level of violence that lasts for periods of decades or so uh, and they're obviously very interesting to us too and we can try and match them up with major phases of Irish history and we could spend another hour on these um, but for in the time remaining um, I'm more interested in looking at these individual years of unusually elevated violence that are superimposed on these longer term trends. And it's certainly an open question as to what drove these years and um, the increase in violence in these years. And there are many factors probably working together. Um, but right now, we're obviously going to try and see whether the Oak data will give us any clues as to whether extreme droughts, say, um, had any systematic contribution. And that's what this uh, graph does. This graph may look a little bit complicated at first, but it's actually quite simple um, once you get used to reading it. What it shows effectively is the average reporting of violent events in these chronicles from killings to raidings in this blue line in each of the 50 drought years themselves. Um, and to put that in, in context, we also see the average reporting of drought uh, in the text in each of the 10 years leading up to these droughts and in each of the 10 years following. So we get to we get to put these the, the violence reported in these drought years into context in this way. Um, and what you see effectively is that in the drought years themselves, there is an elevated reporting of, of violence. And also in the first year, this, this continues into the first year afterwards. Now, there's some statistical testing that's gone on behind uh, this graph too, to, try and tell us whether the, va the values that we see in these drought years are unusually high, how, what sort of chance we would have, have of seeing these uh, values purely at random if we were picking out 50 year, sets of 50 years. And um, any value of this blue line that breaches the, the horizontal red line would have had a, a less than 5% chance of occurring randomly if you were just selecting 50 years at random from the text and adding up the number of violence. So this looks like this is not a random occurrence, that there is a persistent and repeated over multiple centuries response, unfortunately, and perhaps grimly, um, to extreme droughts in terms of an increase in violence in, in medieval Irish society, at least. Okay, so I'm almost done now. Um, we might think then, well, that's sort of an interesting uh, result in a more abstract sense, or uh, if you're an, an Irish medieval historian, but it, what's the sort of relevance to, to us or to other regions and periods or, or to the modern era? Well, we're certainly facing in the coming decades potential serious increases in the severity and frequency of extreme weather events. I think we, we probably would all accept that um, due to uh, anthropogenic climate change, global warming. And drought conditions are actually already implicated or suggested to have been implicated in, in major modern conflicts, including the ongoing Syrian conflict in which a, a multi-year drought from around 2009, I think maybe 2007, uh, 2010 has been suggested to have acted as one trigger uh, for this, 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 uh, this event. Now, these sort of suggestions um, have been very controversial and there's a whole literature and this subdiscipline of climate conflict studies um, and it's right that those sort of suggestions are, are controversial and that they need to be studied uh, very critically, since the triggers to a situation like you see now in Syria will be inevitably complex and of multiple origins. In this particular case, you could say, of course, living under uh, dictatorial governance with markedly unequal access to resources is probably not a long term recipe for social stability, but there is literature that contests that too. And um, I would say that that sort of context actually feeds into um, uh, extreme events as a trigger can make them more effective as a trigger for violence. And medieval Ireland is very different, obviously, in context to contemporary Syria. And yet, I think if similar work combining natural archives and historical records were to be conducted for more regions and more periods and more cultures, um, we might begin to find out how frequently human societies have responded to climatic stress 
uh, through violence and um, also identify the cases, importantly, where violence has successfully been contained or mitigated. So I have pretty much my last slide here to try and end on a more positive note in returning to uh, medieval Ireland to stress that the annals themselves don't, dis despite revealing this response and, and this increase in violence that occurs pretty systematically when there's a climatic stress, the texts themselves do tell us that the society wasn't just a passive victim of extreme weather um, and that there were responses available um, to mitigate the Im its impacts. So for the year 1050, the Oaks identify quite a profound drought across most of Europe. And if we were to turn to the Irish Annals at this time, we would read that there was much inclement weather in the land of Ireland, which carried away corn, milk, fruit and fish from the people. Uh, so there grew up dishonesty among all and no protection was extended to church or fortress, gossiped or mutual oath, until the clergy and lady of Munster assembled where they enacted a law and a restraint upon every injustice from small to great. And God gave peace and favorable weather in consequence of this law. So obviously you have to read this event and this description in the context of who was writing it. There's a political context and a religious context and so on. But the general point um, of uh, the authorities or the elites getting together to try and restore order um, is probably not uh, totally fabricated here. And in fact, you see that, uh, that sort of effort repeated through time um, across multiple centuries. So there were, there were options available and sometimes successfully employed too to try and manage and cope with these sort of conditions. So, um, this is the final slide and really I hope that these sort of examples I presented can broaden uh, the awareness of both historians and natural scientists to the value of each other's methods and their sources. But there is no doubt, I guess, when I teach undergraduates in history, at least in Ireland, that they have very little awareness of the value of natural archives like the Tree Rings and Ice Course for their studies as they embark upon an undergraduate degree in history. Um, and sometimes can even be a little hostile to working with any archive that comes in numerical format. They haven't come to do a history degree to study numbers. Um, but actually pretty quickly, they, they start to see uh, the value of these after a couple of lectures. And I think natural scientists in turn might often be similarly un unaware of the value of past human observations, even into the deeper past of natural events and processes like weather extremes um, and so on. And may sometimes dismiss them as overly subjective or otherwise unreliable. But as I've said, historians are trained to assess the reliability of any given author or source. So a lot can be done to identify records that are of most credible use. And I think really teachers at all levels are critical to changing these attitudes and raising awareness. Um, and then there are many positive signs that that's happening, not least the very fact of, of the GIFT program and its team uh, this year. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, and I think your final point was exactly what I wanted to lead in on, actually, was I think the real value in what you've just demonstrated is the interdisciplinarity. And so often, certainly in schools, which is obviously the major audience today with a set of school teachers in front of us, um, we learn in silos and mm. Yeah, the, histor the history department in school will never talk to the science department. And so at least, you know, the teachers you're talking to today can say, look, there is real value in both these um, different types of records. And look what happens when you marry the two together. So thank you so much for doing that for us in such an, uh, an engaging way. Um, I'm going to go to the chat and try and find any questions. Um, you might want to join me there. Um, sure, yeah, I think Katrine did post something. Okay, uh, great. As regarding volcanic eruptions. Yeah, I so, just had a quick look and found an eruption in 1223, which doesn't fit perfectly, but maybe it's something. All right. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah, no, that would be great. I'd love to talk to you more about that, actually, uh, in due course. But um, yeah, it, it seemed like a, a and a volcanic fallout event or volcanic deposition event to me. And um, if there is a, 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 an Icelandic eruption at the time, that would be, that's the place I would expect mm -hmm. anything to have really come from in, in, great, in a great, in a large enough volume to have impacted like the human health, I suppose. Yeah. So we might be able to solve this mystery perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe. The dre dreadful shower 
in 1224. Yeah. No, that, that's great. Okay. And of course, the other thing that came to my mind, um, as a plant pathologist, one of the great things that influences um, some of these drought, um, these famine events, is the influence of plant disease um, and crop failure. Um, yeah. I don't have records to hand, obviously, but there's another thing to think about as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's a vast amount of work to be done. So, um, and lots of, uh, you know, low hanging fruit, you could say, in terms <laughs> of sources that are available, you know, and translated and, and just contain a whole a wealth of, of observations of the natural world. And um, that can be compared now to this growing body of natural archives or paleothematic data that we have or paleo environmental data that we have. Oh. And I only touched on two of multiple natural archives, just, just scores of, of forwarder sources. Okay, I see Costas has his hand raised virtually. Costas, you're a virtual host now, so hopefully we can hear you if you unmute. Do you want to unmute, Costas? We can't hear you. I closed the camera. Maybe you can hear that's, me now. That's yeah. great, yeah. Yeah, okay. One quick question. This passage in the uh, early on um, at your talk, uh, Francis, from the annals of Connacht, uh, mentioning uh, livestock getting sick when eating the grass and people uh, mm. drinking milk uh, from this livestock getting also sick. Uh, was this from um, uh, the um, uh, 17, no, it was 12, 24. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. There, is, there are some reports in Ireland and um, of at least severe cold weather. Um, after in 1784, yeah, and uh, I think Catherine knows about these already. And I suppose if, if we looked at the, uh, if there, and I'm not sure if there really are very good statistics for Ireland in terms of population health at this stage, but I imagine you would see res deaths from respiratory illnesses increasing um, in 1784, 1785. But that's something um, Catherine may have already actually looked into that, but that would be definitely worth looking into for sure. I'm just I'm asking this because I made a, a quick search while hearing the last two talks in digital archives in Greek, and I found some mentions about 1784 right, uh, yeah. from people in Thessaloniki and the west coast uh, of Asia Minor uh, getting sick, and some um, um, uh, mention this as plague, but others just say they had maladies. Um, right, and so I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah. Well, Catherine can speak to this. I think, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the problem with these sources. Um, there's a lot of talk about diseases in 1783, um, but it's really unclear what the diseases are. They don't necessarily say, "Oh, there's asthmatic attacks," and um, and we could clearly link this to pollution. But unfortunately, it's often just maladies or diseases that are talked about. Mm. Yeah, we. I mean, we see that even now, don't we? You know, with people thinking, oh, COVID was just a common cold or a bad sure. cold. So, you know, how would yeah. you distinguish the two? Mm. Um, we've got one final question, I think, before coffee um, from Helder. Could marine sediment cores be useful extending the volcanic eruption record further into the past? Uh, and do we have any good examples of a correlation between the sulfate peak in ice cores with volcanic ash layers identified or recovered from marine sediment cores? Uh, well, I suppose either a caption or, or I could probably answer that, but the, the answer is yes, <laughs> in general. Um, absolutely, we, we see um, tephra layers in, in marine and terrestrial sediment cores, and um, the tephra is very important because it's unlike the sulfate in the ice cores, the sulfate from one eruption is pretty much identical to the, to the next eruption. Whereas the tephra um, or the ash effectively volcanic glass is unique to each uh, volcano and, and to each eruption. So when you see, so you can basically find and attribute uh, the source volcano to, to that layer of ash. And when you uh, can sometimes correspond that layer with uh, the tephra, which you can also find in the ice as well, you have then a pretty good uh, package of information about that volcanic eruption, how big it was, where it was, 
um, how much sulfate it spewed out and how much it was likely to have impacted the climate and, and so on. I don't know what Catherine wants to add anything to that, but. That pretty much sums it up. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, thank you both. Uh, I'm going to draw it to a close. A fascinating morning so far. Um, we're going to take um, a 15 minute break now. I'm going to shave five minutes um, off our coffee break so that we can return here at 10.15, please, everyone. Yeah, so sorry about that. No, no, um, it was fascinating stuff from both of you and plenty of questions. So it's good to have that opportunity to discuss it further. Um, so 10.15, back here, please, everyone. Um, go and have your breakfast or your coffee, and um, whatever is appropriate. And uh, yeah, just freshen yourself up, ready for our final session, which will be time in case I... Uh, in case I confused anyone before the break, you haven't stepped back in time, despite all the historical references in the um, first hour this morning. It is, of course, 11.17 um, now, Central European time. And we kick off with the second part of our morning session here on day four of the EGU um, virtual gift. Um, where we're primarily going to focus on a practical session that's going to be led by the EGU field officers. Um, but just before that, um, a couple of years ago, there started a really interesting collaboration between uh, Helder Pereira and Solmaz Monager, who is a member of the outreach committee for the EGU. Um, they um, embarked on a teacher scientist pairing scheme um, that Solmas has developed further and we're really um, excited to hear the latest on this and um, see if there are opportunities for the current cohort of virtual gift teachers to potentially engage with this further in the future. So Solmaz has a few slides for us and I'll hand you over to her speaking to us, I think this morning from... Um... Germany. Oh, that's <laughs> not Kubingen. where I was expecting you to be. I was expecting you to be in Uzbekistan, um, but from Germany. So uh, good morning, Solmaz. Yeah, good morning, everyone, everyone. And uh, thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to give you an overview of um, a very exciting program that we have at EGU. And um, we were able to uh, test this program last year. And, um, and because it was very successful, we would like to expand it a little bit more and also involve more teachers and scientists. So I have just a few slides. It's going to be a very short um, overview of the pairing scheme. Um, if there is time for question at the end, I would be more than happy to stick around and answer some questions. Um, you also see my contact information. So feel free to just send me an email. I'm happy to also get in touch with you um, via email. So um, this program is called uh, the Teacher Scientist Pairing Scheme. And as the name um, says, uh, it's a scheme that brings scientists and teachers together. And um, the main goal behind this scheme is actually uh, to support science education in schools and specifically geoscience education in schools. And um, in order to do that, uh, we would like to actually bridge the gap uh, between scientists and school teachers and connect them as equal partners to co-create and co-teach uh, lesson plans that are presented in forms of videos. So that's really the main objective of this program. And this year, um, I'm really excited to announce that um, the EGU Outreach Committee was able to um, get everybody on board and um, um, put together a small budget to support the production of five video lessons, which means that um, we are able to recruit uh, hopefully five teachers and pair them with five scientists to again co collaborate and uh, create these uh, lesson plans that will be um, shared online and hopefully many other teachers from around the world can hopefully find them useful. So the idea here is that um, uh, these video lessons will incorporate a very specific teaching technique known as paired teaching. And I have a few slides on that and I will share that with you um, just very shortly. Um, but the main goal here is that both scientists and teachers are equal partners and that the video lessons are 
based on the curriculum that the teachers are teaching in their classrooms. So, which means that um, whatever that's being produced has to be quite meaningful and relevant to the teachers to begin with. And then um, how scientists can contribute and fill some of the gaps there, then um, those scientists will be recruited based on the topics that are selected by teachers themselves. And um, last year, um, we were able to have uh, one of these video lessons presented live uh, during the General Assembly meeting. And um, I will give you a very brief overview of that lesson. Uh, but Helder, who also participated as a teacher in that um, uh, initiative, uh, is here. And hopefully, he can answer some questions too. Um, but we are also offering, in addition to these five videos that we are aiming to produce this year, we are also offering a live session at the EGU uh, 22 in May. And, um, and we already have a scientist and a teacher paired. And I'll give you some information about that session for those of you who are going to attend the EGU um, week um, later in May. So what is paired teaching? So as the name again says it, is, um, is a kind of teaching methodology that brings a scientist and a teacher together. I took this photograph just a few years ago when I was visiting a school in Dushanbe. Dushanbe is the capital city of Tajikistan in Central Asia. And um, this is what paired teaching really looks like inside of a classroom. So as you can see, um, we have two teachers. We have the in-class teacher um, that is facilitating discussions, interactive hands-on activities um, inside of her classroom. And in the background, we have the scientist or the video teacher who is joining the classroom, not live, but via a video that has been recorded previously. And um, so this, this is what the general look of the, um, what pair teaching really looks like inside of the classroom. Um, but the pedagogy itself um, is um, as it's shown in this um, workflow on the left side. So again, we have this division between the in-class teacher and the video teacher. And if you look at the right side of this figure under video teacher, you see that 25 minutes or roughly around 25 minutes of time is given to the video teacher. Um, and about the same time, um, it's also given to the in-class teacher. So for a one hour um, class, um, half of the session is being taught by a scientist and the other half is being taught by the teacher. And the way it works is that the video teacher introduces the lesson via very short video segments. So every single box that you see on the right side are a video segment of two to about four minutes long. And in these video segments, the scientist or the video teacher um, tries to engage the students um, and um, perhaps raise a question or invite students to uh, engage in a discussion or in an activity that's being done in the classroom. And at the end of each segment, um, the teacher inside of the classroom will pause the video. And this is when the teacher will take over the lesson. So the two, for instance, um, boxes that you see on the left side of this diagram are uh, the segments that are given to the teacher to basically um, fill in the gaps between the video segments. And these are oftentimes discussions or hands-on activities that are facilitated and guided by the in-class teacher. Now, you will see, you see that um, the teaching torch is kind of being passed between the scientist and the teacher. And this passing of the teaching uh, between scientists and the teacher, it's what we call the paired teaching pedagogy. Um, and we are going to use this method to produce these five videos, um, hopefully before the end of this year. And for that, we are going to recruit um, teachers and scientists. Um, since teachers are in the classrooms, um, they are the ones that are not actually going to be in the videos. The scientists are going to be uh, videotaped. However, what is being discussed in these videos, which is basically the lesson plan and all the activities and all the questions that are going to be used um, to teach a lesson are co-created and um, co-taught by both the scientists and the teacher. So the teachers will significantly contribute to the productions of these videos in terms of content, but it is the video teacher or the scientist who is going to be uh, joining the classroom via a recorded video. 
And as I said last year, we were able to have a live version of this um, teaching um, opportunity for the very first time at um, the VEGU 21, where we um, connected a seismologist with a school teacher. Um, and uh, the, both of them came together and developed a lesson plan around the topic of um, volcanic gaps in South America. So if you look at on the left side, um, you see the um, map of uh, South America and the red uh, markers map, uh, mark the locations of volcanoes. And you see there are two dashed boxes there. And those are the places where we don't see volcanoes. And the question is why? Why do we have these gaps? So we had a um, school teacher, science teacher, Helder, connected with a seismologist, a Susana, both from Portugal. And basically they co-taught this lesson um, live as part of the general assembly meeting, which meant that Helder connected his classroom uh, with the EGU participants. And I think maybe some of you who are attending the workshop today also attended this um, session and, um, and it was a very successful and interesting session. We were able to record it. And uh, very briefly, I'll give you the link to the recording of the session for those of you who um, didn't get to see it. Um, or for those of you who are interested in the content, perhaps this is something uh, that you would also like to discuss with your classroom uh, because um, the lesson plans are also available online and you can download them and use them in your classroom. And as you can see, the scientist again has uh, these yellow boxes on the left side. Um, these are the video segments. These are the times that Susanna actually joined virtually um, uh, Helder's classroom and uh, inviting or answering some questions. Um, and Helder basically filled in the gaps in between those yellow boxes by very interesting and engaging activities inside of his classroom. So together, they were able to teach this lesson plan. And um, if you're interested to <clears throat> learn more about the pairing scheme in general, but also about this very specific session that we had last year, and we wrote a blog on um, EGU, and um, here's the link to it. You can go to this link, and later I will put it in the chat so you don't have to write it down. You can just copy paste it and keep it. And, um, and the recording of the video and all the lesson plans that were used as part of this um, lesson this, this session are all available um, in this um, blog post, so you can access them that way. And finally, I will just end uh, the presentation with the um, live session that we are going to have in May. So again, for those of you who are attending the EGU in May, um, I strongly recommend you to come and join Teresita Gravina and Giuliana Panieri from Italy. Um, a scientist and a science teacher who are going to be paired with one another to teach a lesson related to the Arctic Ocean. And currently they are um, in the process of figuring out the lesson plan, uh, developing it. And in May, we will connect with Teresita's classroom in Italy and uh, see how the scientists and the teacher are actually bringing this very fascinating topic um, Arctic Ocean to the classroom of seventh graders. And um, I'll just give you some little information about this session. This is supposed to be held on Wednesday, May 25th. So mark your calendars if you'd like to come and check it out. Um, and the timing for it is 12 o'clock till one o'clock um, CEST. Um, I don't have the link for it because we are still trying to fit it within the program. Uh, but as soon as we have the link, I will communicate that with the education committee and hopefully they have a way of contacting you and letting you know. Uh, but if you look at the EGU program a little bit closer um, to the EGU's week and search for, for instance, um, teacher scientist pairing scheme, the title, um, this should pop up also very easily. So you shouldn't have a hard time um, finding the session. If you have any question, and especially if you want to get involved with the productions of those five videos that I mentioned, um, please feel free um, to get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to uh, give you more information and help you decide if you want to uh, participate in this program. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Salmas. Um, 
something I'm absolutely passionate about, having run a science education charity called Teacher Scientist Network. Um, that's kind of, I think it, it's so valuable for education, this idea of teachers and scientists working collaboratively. Um, so thank you for initiating that within EGU and uh, giving the people today the opportunity to hear about it. Um, I'm going to move straight on, though, um, to really something that is a legacy um, from Chris, um, from Chris King, um, our chairman, who, as you know, has passed away in the last year. Um, he recognised that whilst what we were doing through the Committee of Education was really, really valuable, we could only reach 80 to 100 teachers every year um, at the GIFT conference. Um, and Chris had the idea of developing a growing team of so-called field officers. And those field officers work within their own regions, within their own countries, and upskill um, their own teachers in those regions. Um, but they're gonna work, um, three of them are gonna work collaboratively um, with you guys this morning on a, a hands-on session, obviously delivered virtually. Um, and so it's over to um, Xavier, Julia and Gina, um, who are going to cover some practical aspects of climate, volcanoes and humans. So much to cover in the next hour, hour and a half. Over to you guys. Uh, thank you, Phil, but um, uh, Xavier will handling the presentation, so he'll, he will need to be the host, co host okay. please. If he's not already, I will make sure that he is. There we go. You should have the controls now, Xavi. Okay, okay. Perfect. Um, I'm starting okay, out. Yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Gina and I am the Geoscience Education Field Officer for Portugal, one of the European Geoscience Union Field Officers team. Um, so during this session, my colleagues and I are going to present some earth learning ID activities. But first I will, I will introduce the other field officers and the field officer program. Xavier, please. Thank you. Uh, so the Field Officers Programme uh, is an European Geoscience Union Committee on Education project, was launched in 2018, and Professor Chris King, who past chair of the Committee on Education, uh, that, passed, that uh, sadly passed away last February, was the mentor of this initiative. Uh, he trained us in the uh, programme methodology and materials over an intensive two days training in April 2019, and after during these three last years, Professor Chris King was uh, our role model and a source of inspiration. We have learned so much from him and he was an amazing and remarkable supporter of our work. But he, he was also a lovely friend and a wonderful human being. So we all miss him badly in the next times. Xavier, go ahead, please. So far, the Geoscience Education Field Officers team includes four EGU field officers, uh, me, Julia, uh, uh, Xavier and, Gu and Guillaume, who will uh, join us by uh, midday. Uh, and we have two more members from non-European countries, India and Morocco, the both supported by the International, International Union of Geological Sciences and International Geoscience Education Organization. The field officers are geoscience teachers in service or retired from secondary or higher school and are supported by some national colleagues, the material provided by Earth Learning Idea website and also by EGU Committee on Education. The main goal of this international program, uh, go back please, go, go, yes. Uh, the main goal of this international program is providing professional develop development to in-service and pre-service school teachers from primary to secondary schools in teaching the elements of geoscience appropriate for their teaching curriculum through interactive workshops. So the target are teachers of science of geography who have some geoscience in the curriculum they teach, but who have <coughs> poor geoscience backgrounds and have received no training in geoscience teachers. 
Should we add? Thank you. Since May 2019, field officers completed more than 40 national workshops, some performed face to face and others online because of COVID pandemic. That involved more than 800 workshop participants. Due to the COVID limitations, we also published videos on Facebook and YouTube. Should we add? One click, please. Additionally, to national activities, we performed three online workshops in international events, should we add? and the national and international oral communications at teachers' conferences to promote our activity. One more, thank you. From each workshop presented, field officers collect the evaluation data and provide sample analysis to access the development of the program. Until now, until now, the data shows that the attendees write positive comments on interest, in methodology, organization, usefulness, pleasure, appreciation for the practical knowledge provided, and for the ease of transferring this knowledge to classroom practice. You can find some of this data and additional information about our activity published in journals and in conference abstracts and papers. Should we add? As informed, at present, there are six field officers in six different country, countries. Should we add? But in the field, go back, please. Thank you. But in future, the field officers team will grow up with more than 30 members around the world. Seven from Europe, Albania, Estonia, Germany, Greece, Romania, Turkey, and, and the United Kingdom, and six behind Europe. Burkina Faso, Chile, Colombia, India, Malaysia, and Togo. One for each country, except India, that will have two field officers, one in North and one in South because of its dimension. These new field officers are going to be trained next May in Barcelona. The extending of the program over future years will allow the initiative to reach more teachers and schools across the world and to increase international geoscience trainers network. Thus, in future, additional field officers will be appointed. So, if you are interested in joining this network, pay attention to next call. Xavier, and about uh, the workshops that we provide. The Earth Science Education workshops offered by field officers are based on the 18 years experience of the Earth Science Education Unit in the United Kingdom and are based on practical hands-on, interactive teaching materials and use approach designed to develop critical thinking skills, knowledge and understanding. The practical activities are simple and overall time speedy. The apparatus and materials used are not expensive and are easily available in normal school classrooms and science labs. The workshop subjects include geoscience curricular contents such as plate tectonics, rock cycle, seismology, time scale and history of earth and volcanology. But field officers are also able to promote geopark training courses. As I said, field officers are supported by the Earth Learning Idea website, where more than 380 teaching activities and several explanatory videos are published in a range of languages. Every two weeks, a new activity is published. The activities are listed by alphabetic order or by categories such as Earth as a system, Earth in space, evolution of life, <coughs> geological time, and others in a total of 10 categories. For each activity, a protocol is available where you can find all information needed to develop the activity. For example, the title and uh, one click, please, Xavier, just one click. Thank you. Uh, for example, the title, uh, go ahead, go, go back, please. Thank you. For, for example, as you can see, uh, the title and subtitle, the topic, the age range of students, the time needed to complete activity, the students learning outcomes, the resources lists, or even the following up the activity. The, the different protocols are in the different languages. Xavier, please. You will also be able to follow the Earth Learning Idea website on social networks through its Facebook page. So now Julia, she will introduce case model. Please, Julia. 
Uh, thank you, Gina. Uh, why to use uh, hands-on models and simulation to teach geoscience? Because uh, uh, geoscience uh, addresses phenomena that uh, are far from students' uh, experience. They are too big, too slow, too far, or dangerous. So uh, there is a, a real risk that uh, these topics remain theoretical concepts far from experience and difficult to visualize, understand, remember, and apply. Uh, the use of this uh, methodology also allows to uh, uh, teachers to provide these experiences even if they don't have a, an equipe at the lab. Please, Xavier. Uh, now let's hear from Chris King the theoretical approach, the so-called case model. Please, Xavier. Uh, can you start the video? Back. Back. Uh, start. Please start the video. Okay. This is an introduction in how we can use Earth Learning. This is an introduction in how we can use Earth Learning ideas to teach thinking skills by using the case approach. So what is this CASE program, the Cognitive Acceleration Through Science Education program? Well, it's a program aimed at developing the thinking skills of pupils through science, not at teaching them more science. It's based on the work of the educational psychologist Piaget and Gotsky. It used a two-year intervention in science education for 11 and 12-year-old students. They got one lesson per fortnight, that's 30 lessons and the materials were published in the early 1990s and there was a two-year training program for the science teachers involved. So why was it that teachers and schools got so excited about the CASE program? Well, if we look at the results through the standard assessment tasks that all children did when they were 14 years old, this time in 1996, they found that the achievement in science had gone up by a third, which is pretty impressive. But they also found that the achievement in maths and English had gone up by nearly as much. Remarkable. When a similar exercise was done for GCSE results, these are the exams taken by 16 year olds. They found that the pass rate in, at the C level had gone up by 18% and pass rates in maths and English had increased by nearly as much as well. And when this whole exercise was repeated in 1999, three years later, they found even more impressive results. Science improving by more than a quarter, maths by even more, and English by almost as much. So how does CASE work? Well, CASE is based on what is called the five pillars of case wisdom and here they are there is concrete pre concrete preparation where the teacher prepares the ground they make sure the children are familiar with the words the apparatus what's going to happen and then there is the construction part where children collect data from an investigation and they find a pattern in the data then they find something that doesn't fit that pattern and this causes cognitive conflict. This is called dog cognitive dissonance in America. Then there's the metacognition phase where they're asked to think about their thinking, usually through discussion, but sometimes on paper. And then they're asked to apply these new understandings that they have to new contexts, which in our case might be new earth learning ideas. So let me show you how this works through this short activity. Here you can see a slide that's got the case program written at the top. And under that, underneath that, there is a sentence. When I say now, please could you read out loud what the sentence says? Now. Well, I hope you read out loud the color you see. You read the sentence and you thought to yourself, well, what am I going to see next? Is it colors? Is it words? And how are they going to fit together? 
Well, what I'd like you to do now is to continue reading out loud the colour you see as I click the mouse. Well, I imagine you did what most people do, and that is you started reading out loud, read. Orange, yellow, green, blue. Oh, the blue word is a purple color. The indigo word is a brown color. The violet word is a black color. If you did that, you've been following what we thought you would do to develop your thinking. Because we started with concrete preparation, that was asking you to read out the sentence and thinking about what it meant. Then you found a pattern in the data, which was that the words and the colours were the same until we got to blue, when suddenly there was cognitive conflict because we got new data that didn't fit the pattern. The blue word was purple in colour. Metacognition, thinking about our thinking, is what we're doing now. And then we would take this idea and apply it to a new earth living idea context, and that will be using bridging skills. Well, you might well be skeptical about these results. You might be thinking, is it really possible that 30 hours of specialist thinking teaching for children who are 11 and 12 years old could really improve their exam results? by the age of 16, that's four or five years later, by more than 20%. Well, if you are skeptical and you drill down into the results, you find that this only worked where case was fully adopted by the schools. They taught all 30 case lessons. They bought all the kit, they trained all the teachers and the technicians. They had weekly case meetings to check on progress and they use assessments to measure the progress of the students. But you might think that even that is not enough. But bear in mind that these schools were probably forward looking departments. They uh, might well have done other innovations in science or in other subject areas. And so maybe the whole school was improving thinking skills in that way. But is this enough of an explanation? Well, I'm now going to tell you that my own ideas, the Chris King ideas about why CASE has been so effective. My first theory is that the teachers who trained as case teachers didn't just use the case approach for 11 and 12 year olds. They used the case approach in all their teaching. So that these children had case approaches right through their learning in school. And so did all the other pupils in the school. I also think that some teachers who were already using case like approaches, when they understood the language and the power of these, and they understood how effective they could be, they used them more often with more power and had much bigger impact in future. So now that we've uh, looked at how case works and how case can be effective, let's think about how this can be used for teaching earth learning ideas. These are the references I've used in this talk. And now, Earth Learning Ideas Using Case. Thank you, Xavier. These are the topics of the activities presented by EGU field officers about sea level, about volcanoes, uh, deep time, and the past earth temperature. Thank you. Next. So it's my turn, I think. Uh, so I will present to you three very um, fast activities. Um, these are related with the sea level, which is so controversial in these days. I'm going to, to start first. I can tell you that this is water with food colorant. And I will use this. This is a bottle of uh, uh, refreshment, a lemonade. And I will pour some water here. And I will mark, I hope you can see it. I will mark where's the level 
of the water here. And I would ask my students, I would ask my students, how could they modify increasing or decreasing the level of this sea, this ocean in general, without removing water? Because uh, water in the ocean, water in the earth is not possible to, to remove, to be removed. So uh, they can tell up, um, up to eight different ways. I have here of them, just not to forget any of them. Uh, so they could uh, say, um, they could ask, add, sorry, ice or water, and then the, the, the level would increase. They could, they don't uh, think about this um, in, in the majority of cases, but they could heat the water and then it would increase the volume and therefore the level, the sea level. They could make a hole in the bottom, so the water would leak and the sea level would uh, descend, go down. They could uh, push up the base. This is too rigid to do this, but it, in fact, it could be done. They could deform the sides, and then they could uh, modify also the height of the of the water. I, you see, and, and they could put things on the cup. Mm, uh, pebbles or whatever, whatever, uh, and this would make the, the sea level rise. They could also tilt the cup, and if they tilt it this way, the, the level would rise, and if they tilt it in this way, the level would here would descend. And finally, they could change the gravity, which is also an idea they, they uh, almost never say. In fact, the students can provide about four or five of these ideas. They could think of adding ice or water, especially ice, and we'll see in the next two experiences that I will show you how it works. They could, uh, this is the, the melting of the ice is intended, uh, is expected to be about 50% of the increase of the sea level because of the global warming. The other five, 50% is because of the heating of the water that increases its volume, uh, which is an uh, this is an idea that the students don't have mm, very clear. They uh, to make a hole uh, would uh, the acute, the equivalent in the nature would be when a plate subducts carries with with it a lot of uh, hydrated minerals and th thus releasing uh, um, mm, taking water from the oceans. Push up the base would be uh, what happens in the nature when the uh, volcanoes of the oceanic ridges uh, in, uh, erupt, and this makes the uh, the sea level rise, as it happened, for instance, in the Cretaceous times, where there was a, a lot of uh, volcanic activity. Uh, put things in the cup, the the volcanoes and the sediments that enter the oceans would make the the level rise. And uh, deform the the laterally this cup uh, when two continents approach. In fact, behind the 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 ocean basins increase their um, their surface, and therefore the uh, sea level decreases. It was calculated that when India uh, crash with Eurasia with Asia, the forming the Hama, the Himalayas the general level of the sea uh, descended about 25 meters. So this is a very easy, I will not go on uh, the other aspects because they need a further explanation and, and I don't have the time now, but you can find it in the, in the earth learning idea um, site. So if we analyze what happens with ice and the, the ocean, we have two more, uh, Mm, earth learning ideas that can contribute to explain it. Now we are going to use, this is this is a, a very big uh, um, cylinder, measuring cylinder. And I will put, and this will be our ocean. I make, you see, this is our ocean and this is the, the level of the ocean. And I will put, now I will, uh, model, I will simulate the presence of ice in this ocean. I put three ice cubes here that represent, 
the ice that forms upon the sea in uh, polar areas, like for instance, the, um, the, the Arctic Ocean. So this is ice floating on uh, water. I will show you here the level of this, of this sea now. And now we have to wait until the, I will mark it longer. Now we have to wait until the uh, ice melts. This is a very slow process and I will give it to my friend this, uh, just to use a hair dryer to accelerate the process. And we will see the results by the end of this session after the, the experience by our colleague, uh, Guillaume Coupechou. This is ice floating on the ocean, but we have also ice <coughs> that is on the continents. So here we have this uh, capper's pot. You can use anything in a, in a, sorry, in a, I must show you. This is a copper pot in a in a lab science lab. You could use uh, masses of 100 grams, and it would be the same. Now this is a continent. This is a continent. I will build uh, the sea. Now this is the sea, and the continent. As you see, the continent is emerged. You see that this is the continental part, which is not covered by the sea. And now I will put, I will represent Greenland or Antarctica with some ice on top of it. So I put some ice, again, three ice cubes, three ice cubes that represent the ice sheet on a continent. So we have the ocean, the continent, and the ice cubes that represent the ice sheet of, upon Greenland or Antarctica. Again, I will accelerate the process. You will not see it with a hair dryer. In a classroom, you could be talking about whatever and let the, the, the ice melt. But in this case, I will accelerate the process. So uh, my part is over for now. And uh, I will come back to you with the, with the final result of this experiment. Sorry, I have to mark what is the sea level in this moment, you see? I'm marking the sea level now, so it's here. So by the end of this session, I will come back and show you the result of the experiments. And now I will share my, my screen again, and I will give way to my colleague, Julia. So I share, I share, and now. Next slide. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm presenting you an activity to introduce plate tectonics uh, by inquiry. The materials are very few. Uh, photocopies you can see on the screen. One is a map of volcanoes and a blank map. The other is a map of earthquake and a blank map. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, perfect. Uh, students uh, um, uh, play the game in pairs. The players shot in turns, calling the coordinates. Uh, the other player calls uh, hit or miss. Uh, they continue to shot in turn until a pattern emerges. I tried many times and it is a real discovery by students. The two patterns coincide and uh, draw the, mar the margin of the plates. Then you can go on asking a question to the students, where are volcanoes and earthquakes? Where there are only earthquakes or only volcanoes? It is a very engaging way to, to introduce the topic of plate tectonics by inquiry before starting uh, this topic in your school teaching. I strongly advise to try this approach. Next, please. 
uh, this other activity is about uh, different kind of magmas and lavas. Uh, why uh, some lavas flow further, like in the picture of uh, Kilauea volcano in the Hawaii, and uh, other lavas are thicker and uh, uh, flow less, uh, giving rise to explosive eruption like Mount Santa Helen in the right side. Please, next one. Uh, the activity is based on uh, model lava made of any viscous uh, liquid uh, armless, of course. Uh, I used triacol. Please uh, start the video. Ask the students uh, which factors must may affect it. They will see, say temperature. So we used three containers with uh, triacles at different temperature. On left, a bit colder than room temperature. In the center, room temperature. On the right side, a bit warmer than room temperature. Uh, how will temperature affect the, the viscosity of our mock lava? Let's uh, try overturning the containers. We can use a stop clock or a smartphone to check how much time in each container will take to reach for the uh, mock lava to reach the bottom of the container and uh, link to the temperature of the uh, triacle or mock lava. Next, please. Uh, another activity is uh, about uh, a possible suggestion from your students that uh, substances like fluids or solids within the magma can affect the viscosity of lava. In this case, uh, please, sorry, uh, many thanks. We used uh, another viscous material that is honey, uh, adding a few drops of water. I warn you that uh, when addressing real volcanoes, the presence of, presence of water in the magma has uh, a different outcome due to temperature. You can discuss with your students. This is plain honey. And uh, the last specimen is of uh, honey added with the crystals. You can uh, use uh, or either um, sand or uh, sugar. I use the sugar for this experience. Now you have your three different uh, lavas, you tilt uh, the tile, a common floor tile, and uh, with a stop clock, a smartphone, you can uh, check the time needed to uh, make the route towards the bottom of the tile. You see that the addition of the fluid will make this model lava runnier, while the addition of uh, crystals, solids, it is sugar, and makes the mock lava more viscous and less runny. Thank you. And it's enough, you find the link to the uh, worksheet. Thank you. And now it's my turn again. Thank you, Julian. Following the volcano's activities, I will present the volcano in the lab. And with this, we are modeling the rise of magma throughout the crust and observing how some of it can erupt onto the surface. So we will represent a lava flow while some sets within the water mass representing an igneous intrusion. Material needed is a 500 milliliter glass beaker, a colored candle wax, or instead the candle wax, you can use glycerin soap. Wash it sand, cold water, a bosun or camping burner, a tripod, the gauze, a uh, heatproof mat, a gas supply, matches, and eye protection or safety screen. Even if you can consider that the wax erup erup eruption sorry, may appear to be a dangerous activity, experience has shown that the worst that can usually happen is that beaker cracks 
if it heated too strongly. So if that, uh, in that case, uh, some warm wax can uh, trickle down to the surface. Uh, another, thank you. Before the burner is lit, you can ask the students to guess what will happen at the content of the beaker when he, he heat up. So uh, which will melt first, the wax or the sand? What will happen to the wax once is once is melted? What will rise? Will any of the molten wax reach the top of the water? Will any of the molten wax set in the water? And will the molten wax convert around the beaker? So during this discussion, students can write their ideas in the notebook and after confirm their answers. Then the next step is to heat, heat up the beaker and ask students to watch carefully throughout from a safe distance or behind a safety screen. Uh, now we will watch a video of the activity performed by Professor Christine. This is a rock cycle review activity. It's a plenary activity and this is called a wax volcano in the lab. And what we have here is a burner that I'm now going to light. On top of the burner, there is a bunch. Uh, sorry, there is a beaker, and in the beaker we have some red candle wax at the bottom. We have some washed sand here on top, and on top of that there is some water. And the reason why this is getting some condensation on it is because it's been in the fridge for uh, about half an hour. And uh, that's because it works better if the water's cold. It doesn't have to be cold, but it works better if it is. And uh, this is a, a, a 600 mil beaker, but it works with a 500 mil as well. And what you do is you first of all melt the red candle wax and make, make it uh, make a layer at the bottom. And then when that's dry, or when that's solidified, you put the, uh, the sand on the top. Make sure it's washed sand, and then you add water. So what do we think is going to happen as this wax melts? Well, you might be thinking to yourself, well, if the wax melts, it's going to be hot. It might rise because it's hot, and maybe we're going to get an eruption. And, uh, well, that's what, what may happen here. Uh, is wax lighter, less dense than water anyway? Well, the answer to that is, yes, it is. So even if it wasn't... Um, molten, it might not, uh, it might rise to the surface anyway. You might be thinking, well, maybe it will make a convection current, and uh, well, it may do. Oh, we've got an eruption, and I'm going to turn the beaker around so you can see what happens. And we've got material coming up now, and it's flowing, and it's coming up here as well. And now it's beginning to flow over the surface. And so we've got one eruption with a pipe coming directly to the surface and putting lava at the surface. And this is making a, 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 a mock lava flow. And we've got some more material here that's come up and made a complex of um, things beneath the surface, rather like granite intrusions or uh, igneous intrusions. So we have a, um, a model here of how the Earth works. And I'm going to now turn the, the beaker off. And the model is showing that, that this is the Earth's crust. This is the, the bottom of the Earth's crust, all the Earth's mantle. And when you get partial melting of this material here, the magma rises to the surface. See how when, you, when you've got a pipe, the, the, the outside goes solid first and material comes up the middle of the pipe, which is exactly what happens with the volcano. And then the... Um, material goes over the surface and this is uh, mimicking a lava flow on the surface. So we've got um, it, uh, modelled in wax, uh, an intrusion, an extrusion and the rising of magma before it pours out as lava at the surface. And if I finally zoom in on the top of this, you'll be able to see the lava that's solidifying at the surface more easily. 
the only reason why this doesn't beautifully mimic a volcanic eruption and an intrusion at depth is because in a real uh, eruption, the uh, let me put that so you can see it. In a real eruption, the uh, material underground crystallizes more slowly than the, than the material at the surface, and it's the opposite in this. Thank you, please. This is, this <laughs> This, um, the volcano activity is a very simple and interesting activity. All uh, students always enjoy this activity and the time needed to complete is only 50 minutes to set up the beaker, but you can prepare a, a beaker before the, the class and, the, and then you need to 10 minutes to uh, um, run the activity during the class. The next activity is uh, about the evolution of life. You, we will use a toilet roll of time. So we will construct a toilet roll of time. So we need a toilet roll, and then students can make a geological timeline to take home. So uh, it will be needed 46 sheets from a toilet roll, a timeline marked sheet that you can find in the protocol of this activity in the Earth Learning Idea website, a felt tipped pen scissors and a means of attaching the timeline markers to the toilet roll, for example, glue or staples. Xavier, please. Teachers can organize the class in different groups and each of them should collect exactly 46 sheets so that each sheet can represent 100 million years. Then students should use a felt tipped pen to number each sheet from 0 to 45 with small numbers. They should mark the 4.6 million years, the birth of the Earth, on the final sheet and cut off the paper. Meanwhile, another member of the group should cut out the timeline marker of the timeline as individual strips. They should lay out the strip of toilet paper in a suitable space, if possible, one where the strip can be laid out of the long length. For example, several joint tables, as you can see in the picture, uh, from the left. Given that each punches sheet of toilet paper is 100 million years, they should add the timeline markers in the correct place using glue or staple. The time needed to complete these activities 15 to 30 minutes and students can describe important events during geological time, put these in the correct order, give an idea of the extent of geological time and that the crucial events happened mainly in the past 600 million years, or the last six sheets. At the end of the activity, students can take their toilet roll of time to home and amaze their family and friends. To highlight the point that most of the action of Earth happened relatively recently, teachers can show the students the evolution of life in second se seconds video. So, uh, Xavier, please, can you put the video? Formation of the Earth. Outgassing of molecules. Formation of ocean rocks. Prokaryotic cell photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, photosynthesis by blue-green algae. Eukaryotic cell organisms. Last banded ion formation. Rise of multicellular organisms. Cambrian explosion of waxy coated algae beginning to So a simple activity that joined biology, geology, and history. Now, Guillaume, is your turn. Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, new slides. Thank you. So now we are going to interpret uh, Earth temperatures from a simulated uh, deep sea and ice core. So for this activity, we are going to use some uh, suites. 
For the materials, we need some uh, a few bags of sweets that can be divided in different colors. You will see in the example I will choose, I choose some uh, some uh, sweets easily find in supermarket, and I choose some black and uh, yellow sweets. After some uh, plastic cups, uh, for the example, I use a glass cup, but that will be the same. And after some papers and scissors to cut a paper disc. Next slide. slide. Javier, next slide, please. Yeah, on this one, you can see um, how it will be done. You can uh, use two different type of uh, sweets will represent uh, the molecules of, uh, of water inside uh, that you have some oxygen is isotope. You have two different type of uh, isotope in this experiment. The oxygen 18, it will be the darker colored sweets and also the aviers uh, oxygen, and also the paler colored sweets, it will be the oxygen 16. And uh, you can see on, uh, in red the different layers uh, with different ratios of, uh, of um, sweets. You can see that at the bottom you see more uh, paler <coughs> uh, sweets, means that you that will have more oxygen 16. And uh, at the top, you can see more oxygen 18. Next slide. Next slide, Rabia, please. Yeah, and you can see the use of the uh, disc of paper. I, uh, I will put uh, at uh, every time some slide uh, of paper between the glass, so that will make uh, the layers of, uh, uh, of uh, the ground. And after, what type of question we can ask for the students? We'll ask them to draw a graph of uh, the earth temperatures uh, according what they will see in the ice core or in the deep sea sediment core. If, um, if in the ice core there is uh, less oxygen 18 than the normal, means that uh, the temperature of the earth will be cooler and vice versa. And if the core is um, simulated deep sea sediment core, more oxygen 18 it contains, more cooler the earth will be and vice versa means that we have to look at two things. The first thing is um, how many uh, oxygen 18 and what will be the ratio of oxygen 18 uh, versus oxygen 16. And moreover, where uh, the, the, um, the data will be taken. If it's taken in the ice core, that will be the opposite on the deep sea uh, sediment core. We'll, be, we'll see in the next uh, experiment that uh, there is an explanation of that. But at the first time for this demonstration, we simply ask the kids to look at uh, what we are doing and try to make a ration between temperature and uh, isotope. Next slide, please. Yeah, it's time to experiment together. Next one will be a video. So on this video, we are um, on the ice core. You see the sweets I had, so it's black and uh, yellow. So the first layer, there is a lot of oxygen 18. I will put a piece of paper at the top. We'll have another layer. In this one, I will change a bit. I will put really a few oxygen 18, so the darker sweets. Another piece of paper. And after another glass, means another layer, with this time more dark sweets. And we'll ask the kids, what will be the temperature? We'll give them a graph and they will uh, try to interpret it. We are in the ice core. So 
The first one means the layer at the bottom means that we are with warm earth. The second one, it will be cooler. And finally, it will be warmer. So now, the same uh, fault, but uh, we are in the deep sea sediment core. And we can see it will be the opposite. It will be cooler, warmer, and cooler. That will depend where we are. So from this step, the kids can make a relation between uh, temperature and the quantity of uh, isotope. We'll have a second experiment. Next slide, please. To try to understand that, because it's quite uh, it's quite difficult for for kids. So the demonstration will be easier uh, to understand, help them to understand. For this uh, experience, we'll have some materials, a few bags of sweets that will be exactly the same sweets than before some plastic containers, a tray, and some labels. Next slide, where we can see a picture of that. So you can see on the left of the picture, tropical ocean, we have, um, we have a container with uh, some uh, sweets, half-half between uh, paler and darker sweets. That's not really the truth uh, in reality. Normally, we have only uh, one air oxygen 18 for 500 oxygen 16. But for the demonstration, that's easier like that. We have a, a tray with a written atmosphere. And at the right part, we have a polar ice cape. And now we'll try to make a demonstration to try to understand uh, that. Next slide. We'll ask them some question. Because, yeah, the questions, it can be different type of question. For example, why uh, the density of a water molecule affect its rate of evaporation and condensation? They will, they know that already that the molecule of water contains hydrogen and also oxygen. And this experiment show that we have two types of oxygen, the 16 and the 18. The 18 will be, um, will be heavier than the 16. So for the evaporation, that will be harder for molecules of water with the 18 to evaporate. And it will be easier for the molecule to condensate, so makes rain. We'll do that with an experiment. Next slide. We can go on the next slide to see the experiment. We have two possibilities. The earth will be warm or the earth will be cooler. The first one, we have a warm earth. The beginning, we have the same numbers of uh, uh, paler and darker sweets. We have evaporation, it's warm. We're in the tropical level, not temperate level. Now it's going to rain. So the molecules of water will go down in the ocean. And at the end, when we will be at the pole, the rain will go, we'll have some snow. And we can see that we have uh, a few uh, darker sweets. Now, the earth will be cooler. It will be a glacial period. We'll have still some evaporation. It will be more difficult for the molecules containing oxygen 18 to evaporate. It will be easier to condensate, so more rains with the darker sweets. And at the end, in the glass, we'll have mainly some oxygen 16 and uh, one black was uh, hidden at the back of uh, my glass of uh, representing the ice core. So, we can see a difference. And by this experiment, we can see why the quantity of oxygen, the ratio will not be the same. We will have on Earth the same numbers of molecules, but the molecules will not be at the same uh, spot. If it will be warmer, the oxygen, uh, as you uh, were able to see, uh, will be uh, more con concentrated 
um, in the pole than uh, without uh, warm temperature, where we'll have less oxygen 18 in the pole and the ice core. In the sediment, that will be the opposite. So that's why we can understand more clearly the first experiment. The kids uh, like that because it's uh, easy and um, it's easy with the experiment. Without the experiment, it's more difficult. That's why they enjoy understanding uh, uh, by uh, using that. And for the material, as you can see, we, you don't need a lot of uh, stuff. We need some sweets of different colors. I'm sure there is a lot of brands uh, producing different type of um, sweets, so it doesn't really matter. And after, you need some uh, glass and some papers to label uh, uh, where we are. So basically quite easy and uh, to, pre to prepare and the kids can understand really a difficult concept if it's only written uh, like that. Thank you, Javier, for the slide. So thank you, Guillaume and Gina and, and Julia. And now uh, it's my turn to show you how the experiment that I started uh, a while ago has finished. Well, in for the ice floating on the on the ocean on the ocean, there has been no change in the sea level. So this is there are still some little pieces of ice here, but uh, it would be the same. So this is to let the the students learn that uh, um, for the Arctic ice uh, that has no continent below, even if it melts, it will make no difference in the sea level. Of course, uh, as a secondary effect, as a side effects, there will be lots of uh, climate changes that can produce uh, rise, ri the rising or the decreasing of the sea level. But that's not uh, our our topic now. In this activity, students can learn to read the the, the meniscus of uh, a liquid in a um, measuring cylinder. They can also talk about the density of solids, liquids, and gases, and learn that uh, water is a very strange and very special um, um, product as uh, the solid um, water, that is ice, is less dense than the liquid water. Um, and for the other, for the other activity, uh, ice on top of a, of a continent, here we have, we still have here the continent, even if you cannot see it um, properly, you can see that we have the the sea level at the beginning of, of the experiment, it was here, you can see it, okay, it was here, and uh, now, now it has rise very much. So that, that means that the ices that are on the continents, and especially in Greenland and in Antarctica, when they melt, they make the, uh, the sea level rise. So this is a very uh, simple demonstration with simple materials that can uh, put things more clear for the students. And now I finish here and I give the word to uh, Guillaume that will talk about the, the, the evaluation form and the final slide of this presentation. So I share the screen again. So, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it was almost there. Yeah. Here. yeah, yeah, it's here. Yeah, as you can see on this uh, slide, you have uh, um, internet uh, in address and uh, you have a QR code. You can uh, scan it with your cell phone and you will go directly on the address. And uh, it's very important for us to uh, to have feedback from you guys. And uh, please take some time uh, right now to scan with your cell phone. Javier, I, I already put the evaluation form link in the in the, the chat. And uh, you can see also on this slide some. Uh, the contacts of, um, of, uh, of us, for France, for India, for Italy, Morocco, Portugal, Spain, 
next year the list will be uh, longer with different uh, with other countries uh, so if you have uh, questions uh, and uh, you don't really want to write in english you can write uh, in your own language if you speak uh, spanish you can ask javier his spanish is uh, is better than mine for example uh, for france uh, you can contact me and uh, also if you if you're looking for um, for workshops you have a workshop in your country uh, uh, done by us uh, with uh, egu resources so you can uh, contact us at this email address but the most important uh, right now is the qr code to go to the evaluation form absolutely great guys thank you so much um pleasure what, thanks what, what can i say i mean chris will just be so proud and so pleased that his legacy has continued in this way and uh we saw so many great comments about how engaging this would be and great to hear in the chat as well people speaking of their experience of already using some of these resources in the classroom so we we know that they work and we would very much encourage you to have a go yourselves and uh, and uh, yeah do engage with our field officers so that's it everybody um we reached the end of um day four of gift um just one more session left um that will be on ice and ash and that will be happening tomorrow afternoon um kicking off at 1400 hours central european time or central european summer time um and i hope you've had a great morning i think it's been fascinating um, my final thanks to everybody, the field officers and our speakers before the break and uh, to Helder, who's um, been mindful of uh, all the technical issues in the background um, today. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just add about the evaluation form. What the guys have just shared from the field officers is purely for their benefit in terms of assessing earth learning ideas and the session um, that they have just delivered you will be invited nay encouraged um, nay um, told to complete an instruction uh, an evaluation form tomorrow um, that will come around to gauge your overall feeling of about the gift conference and give us some feedback that we can work with but until then I wish you all um, an enjoyable afternoon or the rest of your day or evening. And uh, yeah, until tomorrow, goodbye. <laughs>